users. Um, firstly, I want to remind that there is a possibility to access interpretation to Ukrainian by clicking on the globe button and vice versa if someone speaking Ukrainian, it's possible to access translation to English. Um, хочу нагадати, що симпозіум перекладається українською наживо і синхронний переклад можна вимкнути, натиснувши на глобус у панелі. The title of the second day is Representation Morning Memory, Working Through War. And um, I'm honored to pass the mic to Marta Kuzma, who is going to share the rationale behind this day and also introduce the moderator of the first panel. Uh, and thank you, Daria, for having been such a wonderful partner in the organization of this conference. Uh, my name is Marta Kuzma, and I'm a professor of art at the Yale School of Art and at Yale University. Um, when we began our discussions, when the core group and the organizing committee began our discussions about how we would enter into this conference, um, there were lots of discussions whether to use the term reconstruction, um, but what appeared to be an important thread through all the discussions was the fact that everyone either in some way experienced or understood the experience of war in terms of trauma. And that we understood that this was very, very important to approach in this conference. And as we further engaged those involved with trauma, we understood that we also needed to make the space for the reflection of mourning. And so that is the way that we begin today, because as we evolve this conference, we evolve discussions about building, construction, rethinking, fathoming futures, but amid not only the experience of violence, but the daily, the precarity of the daily threat of violence. Some weeks ago, we met together with 16 psychotherapists from Lviv um, and Mariana Svirchuk yesterday, who's the CEO of the Lviv Emergency Hospital, spoke to um, those who had been involved in that program. Uh, some of the individuals who are joining us today. And it was a first meeting of psychoanalysts from the Centre Primo Levi in Paris, together with uh, psychotherapists and analysts involved in trauma from the Department of Psychiatry at Yale University. It was an incredible four-day training workshop, and I believe it will lead to a second and further program with a very ambitious project in debut entitled Unbroken. And as we spoke about trauma, it logically led to artists who may transmit these experiences or try to transmit these experiences within their works. And that will further be explored today, as well as a final panel, which perhaps and hopefully optimistically thinks about other models and possible ways to fathom a future in the understanding of what an institution of art can be. Thank you, Dasha, again, thank you, my colleagues for helping. And now I introduce Dr. Beatrice Patsalides Hoffman from the Centre Primo Levi in Paris to start as the moderator of the next session. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm very glad to meet with all of you here today. Um, I would like to first express my thanks to the organizers of this cross-border conference, Marta, Sofia, Michal, Dan, Dasha. Um, I am honored to be here today and uh, will speak with you on this panel and will introduce now my colleagues who are uh, on this panel with me. Um, first of all, Dr. Ole Berizuk, who is assistant professor of the Department of Psychiatry and Psychotherapy at the Lviv Medical University. He's a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst who 
has been, of course, seeing a lot of trauma, traumatized patients these last months. Uh, secondly, I wish to introduce Orest Vazlik, who is a, a psychotherapist, psychologist, art therapist as well, and also visual artist who also works together with Ole Berizouk at the Lviv Medical Center. Uh, thirdly, I would like to introduce Dr. Stephen Marans from Yale University, who is professor of psychiatry and psychoanalysis at the Yale Child Study Center. And he also works with trauma uh, and will certainly speak about this in the course of our discussion. And I will now introduce the topic of trauma and mourning in the context of war and uh, share with you this image. Our title is Bordering a Space for Trauma, Grief and Mourning. Why do we want to think about bordering a space for trauma, grief and mourning? Because trauma in general tends to attack bordering structures, both psychological and physical, symbolic and real, individual and collective. Trauma in Greek means wound. Etymologically relates to piercing. Piercing the protective shield of the psychic apparatus was the metaphor Freud used to describe trauma at first. Trauma in that line of thought means that excessive stimulation has occurred both externally and interpsychically. Excessive stimulation due to a sudden threat to the person's livelihood caused at first fright and shock, freezing of the mind and perhaps of the body, remaining glued to the traumatic scene or flooding with overwhelming affect that the person can no longer contain and regulate. Our patients describe scenes like this. And here you have in the picture the entry in Sergei Gerasimov's war journal on March 6, 2022. A classroom in a school. Fortunately, it's early morning. The room is empty, a blackboard made of thick glass. Everything clean since it's a school. Schools should be cleaner than life. Suddenly, a Bolwanka rocket hits the wall of the school from the outside, almost horizontally. When it penetrates the wall and the blackboard, both concrete and glass lose their firmness, wave-like, as though turning into liquid. The waves unfold symmetrically, like petals of a flower. Then the blackboard made of glass sprinters and the round parts of the concrete wall change into debris scattering all around. Now, is this a nightmare? A memory of a lived experience, a hallucination? As clinicians, we do have some indications to distinguish these. Patients' facial expressions, change of gaze, physical moves, rhythm of speech and of breathing, other nonverbal cues. But we can't always know whether what the patient is telling us as an actually lived traumatic experience is a nightmare or the recount of a traumatic memory or elements of both. Freud said that trauma blurs the boundaries between reality and fantasy. Traumatized persons will be startled by a small noise such as someone knocking on the door as if that rocket was hitting the wall all over but they may have lost the self-observing distance to recognize the as-if dimension. To them, the small noise of the knock on the door is the rocket hitting the wall. Patients who survived life-threatening situations may also tell us they live in a time that seems suspended with terrifying scenes from the past erupting into the present, flashbacks, making them feel disoriented, helpless. For them, the borders or boundaries between past, present, and future may have been abolished. The future often does not exist. 
there is only time present. Now, this is the one reason why the concept of mourning is problematic for traumatized individuals if the traumatic effects are ongoing. Because mourning, of course, implies to acknowledge a definitive loss, for example, of a loved object, which means that the boundary between present and past, the difference between what is still here and what is no longer here, needs to be distinguished. It's as if these patients' psychic skin had become too permeable, porous, pierced. They now live in psychic spaces resembling this shattered classroom, surrounded by dead objects, debris, ruins. In order to border that space of trauma and allow for mourning, we not only need to gather and name what is ruined for individual people with those people, but we also need to gather and document those ruins collectively, publicly, as pieces of conviction for future trials. Because to the collective, protective borders have been broken down daily on all imaginable levels. For seven months now, Ukraine's borders have been trespassed. Houses, walls, windows, doors, all protective bordering structures reduced to rubble. A nuclear cloud that's almost tangible is virtually hanging above our heads, ready to cross all borders. The nation's body of Ukraine is desecrated daily by Russian soldiers. You should know that the Russian army is strong so that you remember us and fear us, said one of them to a U Ukrainian woman while he was forcing himself into her most intimate sphere. Political violence is always intentional. It is seeks to destroy the collective through the individual. Russia has been violating the symbolic borders of all international treaties framing the principles of warfare since day one. Millions of people displaced, not only from their homes, but forced out from the sanctuaries in their minds where they had taken refuge like us in bubbles of beliefs that they were protected by laws, by humanitarian conventions, by cultural and religious taboos, in their right to personal dignity, to privacy, to the integrity of their bodies and their skin and their sexual intimacy. That bubble is now pierced and the illusion evaporated. I remember a patient, a Bosnian woman, who could not directly talk about her right. Ordering her psychic space meant listening to what she could not yet put into words. In sessions, her knuckles would turn white from her squeezing her fingers so tightly while talking, for example, about the moment her father had been killed in front of her by Serbian soldiers. She hadn't had her period since then, which meant to her that her blood the redness of life and fertility had stopped circulating in her body. She said that as a woman, she was dead. Eventually, she could evoke the whiteness in her mind, her amnesia about the red butchery, a condensed scene of her own rape and her father's murder. She rejected the idea to ever get pregnant and kept her hair cut ultra short. One day she said she kept her hair short and light because of the heavy migraine headaches pounding under the top of the, her skull, like the sensation, she said, of bombs falling on her city. She needed, she said, that memory of a sensation to feel alive, a survivor, a witness, and not a victim. Patients like her may need their symptoms to protect them from complete mental breakdown, to know that what they saw and experienced was true, real, and not imagined, so that others can know about it and believe it. Sometimes only a physical symptom can locate and give hold to the trauma, which in therapy can open up the process of mourning, of speaking, about the whiteness in the mind and the losses of loved ones and of accepting to be separate from the dead. 
how do we psychoanalysts border the therapeutic traumatic space to let this process of grieving and mourning unfold? I thought in this case, by giving space to the patient's choice for speech and for silence. Space for her having loved her dead father and for hating him too, for having left her, for having inflicted the pain of taking away with him a part of her that she may never find again. She didn't know whether he ever had a grave. So I would like to ask now Ole Berezuk to speak to us about his thoughts on trauma, bordering the space of trauma, for trauma, grief and mourning. Ole. Ole, you have to turn on your microphone. Thank you, Beatrice, uh, for a very emotional and deep introduction to the topic. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting us for this symposium. And thank you for providing the space, uh, virtual space for uh, thoughts and talking about the Russian-Ukrainian war and, uh, and how to handle it. First of all, uh, let me thank everyone who helps Ukrainian to fight for our freedom, uh, our independence and peace for the whole world in the war with the most brutal enemy of the 20th and 21st centuries, Russia. Uh, it's we have to say really glory to Ukraine and to Ukrainian heroes who right now, in this moment, in this second, is fighting, fighting with the enemy for, for us, not only in Ukraine, but in Europe and in the world. Glory to them. At the beginning of my speech, I would like to say that my today's thoughts are inspired and structured by cooperation with the Yale University PTSD Center and the um, Department of Art and Primo Levi Center in Paris. Special thanks uh, to Dr. Shelley Ayman, Dr. Beatrice Petalitis Hoffman, and of course, Marta Kuzma. And I really would like to say that in cooperation we trust. Um, after February 24th, after Bucha, Irpin, Borodyanka, after the stories from the occupied territories, Kherson, Kharkivska, Oblast, and others, we already knew as a doctors that we would be dealing with the millions of people who would um, suffer from war, physical and mental trauma. We knew it uh, theoretically from uh, WHO that uh, said that 10% of people who have survived um, a traumatic war event will, be, will have symptoms of psychological trauma. And 10% will have behavioral and the mental disorders that significantly impair their quality of life, such as anxiety, depression, psychosomatic and psychotic disorders. We also knew uh, from um, the Soviet Afghan war uh, uh, that in 73% of cases, um, mental disorders occurs in patients with the injuries. And uh, um, among them, uh, the almost half, this is the specific asthenic symptoms, 70% psychosis, and acute traumatic reactions. We also knew from our NATO colleagues yeah, and their experience in Afghanistan and Iraq, recent one, 
that 12% uh, of soldiers would develop uh, PTSD symptoms and 18 would develop the other mental disorders. So if to apply it to our situation, we already can predict how many of people would be suffering. We knew it all, but we didn't know that there would, that, that there would be so many people who suffer. And the, the, the Minister uh, of the Health of Ukraine, Dr. Leshko, even made the approximation that uh, 15 million Ukrainians will need psychological support. And three and four millions will need medical treatment regarding the mental health problem. Only in our Lviv First Medical Union, the hospital I'm working for six months, the six war months, we treated 11,500 internally displaced people and militaries, including 1,000, more than 1,000 children, 200 pregnant women, and among them, more than 1,000 people with a very severe combined physical and mental injuries. And I wanna tell you from this experience already, Without any exception, all of them suffered from traumatic psychological distress and or psychological disadaptation or acute stress reaction or symptoms of PTSD or other psychiatric disorders. All of them, no exceptions, needed some kind of psychological support starting from psychosocial support and or psychological counseling and or psychotherapeutic intervention and or psychiatric treatment for the uh, drugs. I would like to note that working as a psychotherapist with the wounded civilians and militaries I can say that uh, war trauma is terrible, devastating, physically, psychologically, and socially. I saw it before this in the movie and read in the books, but unfortunately, now I'm witnessing how it's developing in my patients. And sometimes I have a chilly neck, have never had before. And when I'm listening to those stories, war trauma, torture trauma, captivity trauma, force people to isolate themselves, bypass help and suffer. People are not complaining in our hospital about psychological problems. Usually they're complaining about pain, sleeplessness, and the physical problem. And actually the doctors in our hospital, the surgeons, the, the internal doctors, they are, not, they are not asking about those symptoms that we are asking when they're coming to that, which is a big problem. People, people avoid to talk about psychological trauma and moral trauma. People who got, people who go to protect their homeland and are injured by the enemy should know that care and treatment await them. Otherwise, people would isolate themselves, become lonely in trauma, which very quickly leads to physical, psychological, social decompensation in the form of severe physical chronic diseases, alcoholism, drug addiction, aggressive antisocial behavior. Traumatic isolation is for sure is the case of death and the aggression that often accompanies it is nothing more than a cover 
or unspeakable grief, sadness, and longing for love and care. That's why it's very important, and we can witness it right now here in the hospitals, that from the beginning of, uh, of staying in the hospital, people should be provided by basic social psychosocial support, giving the warm drink, clean clothes, shower, and of course, talking about relatives and connecting them to the relatives. Amazingly simple procedures, but doing a lot, stabilizing their psychological state. Humanity actually has known about this for a long time. You know, the history of humanity is the history of wars. And the, the pretty uh, quote from William Shakespeare that uh, uh, I was uh, uh, presented by Shelley, and I thank her so much for this quote. Uh, William Shakespeare, as a genius of condensed, condensed thoughts in poetry, proposed actually the way to treat the trauma of grief and sorrow. The quote, give sorrow words, the grief, that does not speak, nights up the heart and breathes at the break. It is our task as a society to create conditions where a person affected by war feels safe and cared for. Then her or his grief will speak and her or his heart will not break, but will be place for love and development. What to do? We really understand that we must quickly build up our medical and rehabilitation institution and capacities for civilians and military to provide this space. We must, as quick as possible, to reconstruct our old fashioned, still Soviet like psychiatric institution, structurally and by meaning, and to construct a contemporary mental health system which would create patients and client oriented space, which would be transitional space from war suffering to peace prosperity. Here, I would like to point out uh, an importance of military civilian cooperation in creating those psychological civilian transitional spaces for military personnel for adaptation to non-war civilian environment and civilian style of living. It's very important for those young people who will come from the front to their homes. So, how we should do it? Very simple. <laughs> Increase the availability of psychiatric and psychotherapeutic and psychological services. How? Very simple and, kind and relatively cheap. Open psychiatric departments in multidisciplinary hospital. And we will reach two goals. First, availability. And most important, destigmatization of psychiatric and psychotherapeutic health, which is a problem in Ukraine with the post-Soviet psychiatric system. And it's not expensive. We open such a, such a department in our hospital. I'm now working here and I'm now sitting here and talking to you. And it, it was not, we, we just, we opened it in September, 2021. And now we can see how the big difference between the form and the meaning of providing this service. Well, the... may, may I ask you to yeah. come to a close? Uh, okay, okay, okay. Soon, yeah. And, uh, and during the war, uh, we observed a patient uh, uh, from the combat zone in, in our department. And we noticed that uh, 47 of them diagnosed with the PTSD. Uh, and the 40% the 
it was a from the civilian population and 100% of patients who was the military in our department, it was a PTSD patients. Next, we should improve the quality of service and it's a learning. And we are starting to do this uh, with cooperation of many institutions, including Yale University, Primo Levi and other. Um, what we are doing, we are creating a model of national rehabilitation center, which we called Unbroken. This is the multidisciplinary approach with the rehabilitation, not only psychological, but also physical and surgical. What support we need? We need experience in creating and managing, in managing some such rehabilitation. We need new technologies and we knew we have to study a lot about PTSD and help people who are affected by the war. Okay. Uh, our goal is to create a modern model and not only create here, but also distribute it to this model in Ukraine. I think we need five of Tevin. And finally, Patrice, we are welcome all of you to become our partners and ambassadors of our efforts to reconstruct environment and create a space of trust and care, which will allow people in needs to speak out their sorrow, liberate their hearts from the captivity of grief and open them to courage of love, cooperation, and of course, prosperity. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Ole, for this uh, very detailed and heartfelt exposure of the actual situation that you're facing in Lviv the hospital. Uh, I would like to now invite um, Orest Vasilik uh, to speak to us, who is working in a different uh, function at the same hospital. Uh, Orest, would you? Yes. Hello. Hi. <clears throat> First, uh, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I thank you uh, for your time, for your ideas and for your help. Um, I have some uh, annotations, so I will uh, uh, read them and I translate uh, uh, them uh, by uh, myself, so please uh, be, uh, be patient. Um, I was thinking, uh, I think of a grief as an emotion associated with a specific entity or subject. So even after loss, uh, that needs to be uh, released. Uh, but uh, as you can often see, uh, a griefing can go on in, uh, indefinitely. Uh, that is a griefing itself like any other emotion does not solve problems completely. But what does is uh, the element of dealing with those emotions. As we can see, a person can scream, can cry, but still get a bullet in her head. Uh, the emotions as uh, uh, by themselves indicate to us the level of importance uh, and importance of uh, the lost uh, 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 subjects for uh, for uh, for us and tell us how to deal uh, deal with it. Uh, in every case, uh, uh, the level of importance is very in, uh, individual. So every time it is a new uh, a meeting and a dealing with new uh, subjectivity and new aspects of, uh, of a human being that want uh, to live. In this case, I would consider the psycho, uh, 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 psychotherapeutic space itself as a tool for dealing with emotions, a process of finding a substitute 
uh, with the subsequent possibility of resyncing and transforming everything related to a specific attachment to the lost subjects, requirements, and resources. Uh, the requirements uh, now for the internal object lead, lead to the constant acting out of anger at oneself. Uh, this uh, and uh, this associated with the specific responsibility of this internal object, which leads to the disappointment of internal expectations and ideas of how things should have been. The psychotherapeutic process can be a, a container for a grief, like anything that, contain, uh, that uh, uh, contains the a phenomenon of the process of uh, a mourning. But for individual issues uh, as, as a way to, uh, to relieve is to find a solution to our goals, which also we need to understand. The search process also needs a, a container and, and it can be a problem a solver, but uh, the duration of our suffering depends on how we search and whether we search at all. Based on upon, we have a, 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 a phrase that I'm a, 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 a little uh, that I'm a little very off. Uh, 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 that uh, that phrase uh, 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 sounds like heroes never die. Uh, I propose to think about this phrase. Yeah. Given the above, uh, I would I would say that the living should live, and the uh, uh, deceased should be re uh, be remembered. You can find a solution by understanding why this loss was so important. Without realizing the importance of the loss, we will not find a continuation of ourselves in life. That is why it is so necessary to talk ab about. Uh, yesterday, I spoke with a volunteer, a teacher who works with displaced children and uh, their parents. And ac according to her, 20% uh, of those people can't be very grateful for the help that their city provides. We can say that everyone uh, in their families uh, uh, survived. But something else was uh, or, uh, or uh, were lost. Everyone experienced his own grief, for which there is sometimes no place. Both children and adults isolate themselves. Uh, they, not knowing, uh, they don't know how to implement their grief, their loss, and their lifestyle in a society uh, because uh, too fast so we face a, a dilemma of a trust uh, a psychotherapeutic space that includes aspects of uh, acceptance acceptance learn how to work with new processes of intrapsychic and social uh, social implementation so thank you Thank you very much, Orest, uh, for this very moving presentation. Um, I think you raised many important points that we will take up in the discussion uh, afterwards. Um, I would like to invite now Stephen Marans to join our discussion and present, Stephen, the thoughts you have had in terms of the, the topic we are addressing today. Well, first, uh, I am 
humbled and honored to be with you all today and glory to Ukraine. And we stand in solidarity with you all. Um, I, I am, um, and my, my experience, I'm the co-director of the Yale Center for Traumatic Stress and Recovery. And over the last 30 years have spent considerable time learning about by addressing and, and meeting with and learning from uh, people, children and adults who have been overwhelmed by circumstances of, of um, horrific uh, murders, rapes, um, assaults, death, and have responded to individuals and families and communities, including in the aftermath of mass casualty events such as 9-11, school shootings and the like. And I, I wanted to begin by um, uh, actually recognizing um, these wonderful uh, presentations. And I wanted to add to uh, Beatrice your uh, comments about Freud's earlier conceptualizations that it was in the wake of World War I that Freud first described the traumatic moment. And without quoting him directly, I wanted to pick out just one element which is when he talked about the differential between the magnitude of the danger uh, and the up against the ability to mediate the associated stimulation. And in fact, what Freud talked about, uh, the traumatic moment consisting of a convergence between internal and external dangers. And as I've listened so far this morning and found myself so moved, I'm reminded how much we all know about those internal dangers that converge with uh, the external world of war and terror. And I just wanna give words to those shared fears and dangers that we all have as human beings, the loss of our own lives, the lives of those we love, the loss of love of others and the love of ourselves, damage to our bodies that we love and the impairment of our functioning of, of our bodies, the loss of control of impulses, affects, and the capacity for integrated thinking, and the loss of external structure and order that provides the basis for anticipating, planning, and responding to new challenges. Since Freud's time, we've actually learned a great deal about the details of this traumatic situation to which he was referring. And for the purposes of our discussion, um, I, I would suggest that we might best define the traumatic situation um, as one in which the individual experiences an overwhelming unanticipated danger that leads to loss of control, the reality of loss of control, the experience of helplessness and internal chaos, the immobilization of usual methods of defending against danger and anxiety, and the neurophysiologic dysregulation that compromises affective, cognitive, and behavioral responses to stimuli that's experienced and we describe as terror. We know that the normal early and at times persistent vulnerability to dysregulation can lead to a host of post-traumatic reactions and symptoms that not only lead to suffering and disruptions of optimal functioning, but in fact constitute a perpetuation of the original experience of loss of control, even when the immediate danger has passed. And as has already been pointed out, um, uh, even more persistent when the threat of danger continues. Indeed, the challenge to regain a sense of personal control is exacerbated as original event-related experience of traumatic loss of control are revisited with experiences of continued neurophysiologic dysregulation. And Ole was referring to uh, some of these in terms of heightened startle responses, headaches, stomach aches, increased heart and respiration rates, and the introduction of new or increased affective cognitive and behavioral symptoms that happen automatically 
out of awareness and out of the hands of children and adults who are so impacted. And the sudden intense onset of these somatic, cognitive, and affective symptoms of dysregulation may be additionally distressing when individuals are unable to consciously locate the traumatic reminders or triggers that give rise to their appearance or intensification. As I was um, thinking about the topic and the title of this segment of the conference, I was thinking about the parallels between warfare, the goals of the struggle of our Ukrainian friends and colleagues, and the task at hand for dealing with uh, and supporting the recovery from uh, trauma. And Beatrice put it so beautifully in terms of the piercing of normal boundaries in the same way that the invasion has been a piercing of normal boundaries. And that in fact, the shared goals are the reestablishing of boundaries and the reestablishing of order, structure, the alleviation of chaos and the return to optimal capacities of self-observation and increased controls. In many ways, a model and the phenomena of trauma can serve as a roadmap for our approaches to ameliorating the impact of trauma. It's important to remember, as Ole has pointed out, that there are different phases of traumatic responses, traumatic reactions, and that those have significant impact in terms of how we attempt to address the needs of, oh, so many people uh, that are currently impacted and at risk for post-traumatic dysregulation and ongoing traumatic uh, dysregulation. And that leads us to the idea of uh, the first order of our therapeutic interventions need to be supporting the reestablishment of order before we can actually help people return to a place in which representational thought and organized make meaning making can actually occur. The good news, if there is any good news in, in the midst of such horror, is that we've learned a great deal about how to help children and adults reestablish that order through evidence-based, and in fact, when speaking as an analyst, but in fact, at first, through highly structured approaches that first and foremost help individuals to even recognize what's happening to them. Um, and so we think about not only the implementation of early interventions, which we at Yale have helped to develop and have uh, 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 disseminating uh, around the world and hopefully with our colleagues in Ukraine, but also the implementation of longer term uh, trauma focused treatments that again aim first to help increase and reestablish self observing capacity, reduction of, uh, of, of the disrupt, uh, a, a reconstruction of the capacity to regulate feelings, thoughts, emotions, uh, and somatic responses. Um, and that, that these efforts um, can actually be enormously success successful in helping individuals to recover so that they do not have to suffer the longer term impacts about which we know, unfortunately, a great deal. There are some major challenges However, as Ole and Orest know very well, which is that not only are individuals and an entire country of individuals at risk for traumatic dysregulation, but as professionals, uh, the ability to address their needs 
can be overwhelming in and of itself. And so in some ways, the phenomena, both of the individual experience and the larger group experience, can also inform the map of reconstruction, which includes approaching a public health uh, dimension to uh, strengthening and supporting recovery. We know, and Ole, you mentioned this, that two of the most powerful predictors for more positive outcomes, greater recovery, is simply the ability to identify and recognizing that one is experiencing traumatic distress. And the second most powerful predictor is the availability of familial and social supports. And so at the public health level, particularly in a country that has, was long dominated by the Soviet style of psychiatry, the aim to increase public awareness that gives words to their experiences and the commonality of their experiences may be a first step in a public health approach that includes not only the normality of experiences that people are having, but include some approaches to self-care in re-establishing uh, regulation and recognition, decreasing isolation that can perpetuate the very reactions, symptoms from which people may suffer. The next level is informing providers who are most likely to have contact with these people, not because they're coming for post-traumatic care, but because of all of the physical complaints or the disruptions that bring them to their, to their attention. And the next is then to uh, build capacity of our colleagues who may have extensive experience in treating psychiatric and psychological problems in the course of their normal practice, but may have little background or experience in providing and uh, uh, evidence-based and uh, approaches to trauma-focused treatment. And so building capacity at that level also increases the opportunity for both identifying those in need of additional clinical care, um, as well as attempting to meet the needs, not only in the consulting room, but in the broader community. Even I, may I ask you to come to sure. the No, I'm just coming, coming to an end now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm looking forward to our discussion. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I also want to add one more protective factor, which is not only reducing isolation, but the protective factor of a shared purpose, common goals, and solidarity. And in that, we stand with you all. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, so, of course, there are many avenues we can take in this discussion. Uh, I think some key points that were raised here is not only the way what we do as caregivers with these extremely, sometimes extremely traumatized patients, but how we do what we do. Because it seems that in this particular trauma that we are facing in the context of war that is man-made and intentional, what has been attained is the perception of the other human being as a potential murderer, the intention to kill. And as Ole pointed out, to start out with very basic human gestures of giving a patient a cup of tea, for example, or clothing, that that starts to reinitiate the, simply the human dimension between one human and the other. And that that in itself oftentimes is perhaps the first but fundamental step in any kind of treatment, whatever the treatment may be. Um, 
perhaps you would like to respond to each other or uh, ask some questions that you may have of each other, the, the panelists. I think we are all on the same page. Uh, it means it would be nice to hear the question from the, from the audience. Yes. So I will read uh, the question, but it's raised by Rud Meiji. Unless uh, you want to speak yourself, Rud. So I will read what you wrote. Uh, apart from trauma, I'm also thinking of moral injury as a way of coping with the experience of feelings of moral failure. We know this from the Vietnam War. And for instance, with dealing with military experiences of failure in Srebrenica. It differs from trauma in some important aspects, also for therapists. Rud, did you want to address this question to someone in particular? Or who wishes to respond to this comment? Uh, May? Ole, yes, please go ahead. Uh, actually, uh, when we start to study and learn from our colleagues and from our experiences about post-traumatic stress disorders, the issue of moral trauma became a, a big issue for me. I start to see it as a basic actually uh, for post-traumatic stress disorder. The symptoms of PTSD or something else, it's a, it's a only a, a, a visual part of the iceberg. The moral trauma, from my opinion, is living be, 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 be under the water. And it's, uh, it's from, the, from the patients, yeah? I'm using uh, myself, uh, the intervention uh, expositional uh, narrative therapy uh, with the PTSD, especially with the militaries, and I'm noticing that repeating those story, every next repetition, bringing some new specific episodes of the uh, of the trauma episode, but the and the fifth, seventh, tenth, eleventh session, those episodes are close to the moral trauma point. Those episodes is very, it, it's forgotten, yeah, mm -hmm. in deep in the memory because they are touching the moral issues, the internal internalized mm, rules that are not in question, but war made it in question, and it's the most difficult part of the therapy because the patient should ex explain himself how to deal with the questioning moral rules that he usually not questioned before. And, uh, and for sure, it would be the main, main, uh, main topic for the longer therapy. Very interesting and new concept for me as a, for a psychotherapist. And, uh, and actually, I, I just start to think about this. Uh, if I can just say something uh, here, uh, of course, this question of moral trauma in uh, has been around in the uh, among the people who work with patients of PTSD affected for a long time. It came up in the context of Judith Herman's research on complex PTSD and the ways that people are affected in their self-perception and basic beliefs about themselves and the world. Uh, it, it's beyond, uh, you know, the, as you pointed out, the immediate um, uh, PTSD symptomatic effects. But uh, what seems important here, and that is the question that Orest also raised, the self-aggression, the self-incrimination the question of guilt and the aggressive 
ways and self-destructive ways that some patients uh, react with after the trauma and the difficulty to externalize aggression. Stephen, you wanted to say something, I think. Yes, I, I'm so appreciative of, of this discussion. And I, I, I think that, you know, the, the breaching of some of the most fundamental superego imperatives, for shorthand sake, mm -hmm. is one of the sources of loss of control. And I think that uh, if, if, if one thinks about, is there any advantage to the self-recriminations that we see so frequently in the aftermath of traumatic experience. The one advantage is, is that it is an attempt at some levels to reestablish by uh, control in, in almost an in intervention fantasy in which the self-blame actually asserts uh, a different version of reality, meaning that one could have had control it's an attempt for many to try to reestablish an order, but at such a high cost. And I, just one other item that it's one of the reasons why helping people to have a greater appreciation for what they're experiencing, including some of the typical responses and why they may be having those typical responses becomes so important because as you were suggesting, Rest, that often what we will hear in patients is the repetitive over and over and over nature of their preoccupying thoughts, which in and of itself is a symptom of the traumatic dysregulation. Helping people to understand what they're experiencing and why is often the first step to then focusing first on the uh, achievement of greater control at less of a cost. Someone of the audience is asking, could you please clarify what moral trauma means? You want to speak for that, Ole or Steven? I, I would like to just give an example. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one, give of, an example. one of my yeah. patients, uh, and what well, it's more than 10 sessions already, a, a, a military uh, uh, educated guy. And um, and with the with the with the obvious symptoms of PTSD, and uh, in one session I asked, so no, let's let's talk about some episodes that you would like to present uh, today. And he said, you know, I'm writing a, a virtual book in my head, because okay, and I I have a chapters there, and you know what is the first chapter is in my book? I said. No, of course I don't know. I said, this is the chapter, my first killing. My what? My first killing? Killing. Yeah. My first killing. My aperture uh, uh, This is the example of moral trauma. And he didn't tell me about this in the first lecture, first uh, session. Yeah. It was already a good rapport, rapport between us and compliance and trust. And he decided to open his book from the first chapter. So this is the, this is the moment on, uh, of conflict between internalized rules, moral rules, and the war, which give completely new rules, yeah, which is not applicable to peaceful life and you have to comprehend some way you have to understand some way at this comprehension cost energy and sometimes very often i would say most of the times it uh this compens decompens cost decompensation yeah mm -hmm. that we cannot comprehend it and we have to present the symptoms and behind the symptoms is the suffering of uh, this compromise. Um, there is another question. There are, more, there are more questions. So I think I'm gonna uh, give a little bit of space to the audience. There is a common question by St Jeff Stepniski. Uh, 
He says, I'm a sociologist and was struck by the frequent mention of social dimensions of care for trauma, therapeutic space, relation of personal borders to territorial borders, need for creation of public destigmatization efforts. Would the panelists like to say more about the link between the individual and the social, the role of government and civil society agencies in establishing broader conditions for healing? Who would like to respond to this? Uh, Orest, would you like to say something here? No, not yet. Steven, Orle? I, I think it's a, it's a wonderful question and it's especially uh, I mean, it's enormously significant. So, um, and this is where the individual and the group uh, recovery are one and the same. Again, the, the, uh, the, the role of broader society and of, of government organizations and agencies is to actually support recovery through increasing solidarity and community, which basically translates to we're in this together and we are having, we are all at risk and vulnerable mm -hmm. to normal reactions, to overwhelming experience. And that one of the tasks is to reduce isolation and increase individual social support. And one way of doing that is um, actually broadly disseminating information to the broader community about what are normal reactions, including the changes that occur in response to overwhelming events. Again, one of the hardest things for us as human beings is to tolerate when we have lost control of ourselves, when we have not been the masters of our domain and the same is true for countries. One way of achieving increased social support is by actually providing a shared frame of reference and this can be done and has been done in other circumstances by increasing a uh, public awareness of uh, normal responses and as well as concrete uh, strategies for increasing and supporting recovery of each other. Beatrice, may I add a few seconds? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, uh, besides a psychoanalyst, I'm a, a Adlerian. It, 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 this is a very easy question for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 the human beings, we are creatures, we are social creatures. We cannot survive alone. We only surviving in the, in the cooperation with others. Yeah. And uh, Alfred Adler uh, had a concept, a social interest. Without interest in other people and interest of other people to us, we cannot be successful in, without cooperation. That's why this is the basic thing, yeah? To have others that care for you and you care for others. It's very simple and very difficult. And moreover, I and we here in our Lviv school saying that social interest is the innate characteristic of humankind. And uh, because it's, survival instrument. So love, aggression, aggression, and social interest. And the three drives probably that would uh, that made us a, a human uh, um, besides of course, thinking and uh, speaking. Well, I would like to add something to this uh, since I think this question is a very important question. And of course, the, the destigmatization is is a crucial question that <clears throat> has some has something to do with the way in which we consider the production of symptoms and what symptoms speak for, and in way they are a matter, a way of speaking about uh, what the person has trouble putting into words, and of course, this trouble to put. Uh, traumatic experiences into words has to do with ultra cultural taboos. And uh, I think these uh, questions about shame and guilt again, 
uh, can be worked with on various levels on the, as we heard yesterday, on the artistic level, and I think we will hear, hear more about that, uh, that uh, uh, spaces can be made available for uh, different kinds of public happenings. And I think we also need to include our, ourselves in this uh, questioning of the effect of the trauma of war on us, the caregivers. I think, Ole, you mentioned something in the beginning when you said you were, that was sitting as a chill in your neck. So we are not exempt from uh, being impacted by the effects of the trauma of war and having our own psychic spaces attacked. And so I think there's also something to say about how the caregivers that are usually uh, uh, approached as uh, the subject supposed to know, you know, that we also have to uh, reveal our own uh, uh, not knowing and the ways we struggle with our own vulnerabilities. So that, uh, you know, in a way there's a rebalancing of and questioning of the distribution of power in the, in the therapeutic setting that goes in hand with the question of destigmatization, I think. And I would just add very briefly that with response to the, what role can agencies play, I guess then what yeah. I would, what, what I think can support the very efforts that both you and the rest were talking about is a, a public health campaign and who is delivering information matters. Um, and mm -hmm. the idea of establishing a common frame of reference for the general population can serve an enormously important function in reestablishing individual order by increasing the tools for self-observing capacity, as well as recognizing the commonality mm -hmm. of experience amongst all of us in these mm -hmm. circumstances. There is another question from the audience, oh, Evgenia Skvor. Can I? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, please, arrest. Uh, uh, I want to say that um, uh, I want to start from a fresh. Uh, uh, all have a, a, a their time. Yeah. So um, if uh, uh, something feel uh, really ur uh, ur urgent, yeah. Uh, so uh, we need to un uh, understand why it it feels uh, like that for uh, 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 some people. Yeah, and um, I really uh, I don't know how we can be uh, compassionate for something we are uh, uh, we are uh, don't know. Yeah. So uh, mm. if we uh, if we uh, if we try to uh, uh, repress uh, some um, uh, some uh, people, they would a potreba needs needs and needs yeah uh, maybe we don't. Uh, understand what mm -hmm. that uh, what that uh, 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 what that uh, a human being really needs yeah so uh, mm -hmm. we need to uh, try to understand so i don't know how we can uh, to uh, to be economy uh, for, uh, uh, for, uh, for something we uh, i don't know yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like you that. are you are you're saying, if I understand you correctly, that we should be aware of our own resistance to what perhaps we can only know very partially and understand only very partially, and be patient to give the agency to the patient to speak more or work through, as you said, you know, their grief, uh, their, their crying, their emotional upheaval, and not try to repress that because we can't tolerate their experience. 
Yes, yes. Be patient. Yeah, is that is that is that what I hear you yes, say? Yes, yes. Thank okay. You. <laughs> okay. Let's go to the next question. Uh, Evgenia Skvortsova. I hope I pronounce this not too much a distorted way. This question is addressed to the whole group. Thank you everyone for the life affirming and deep remarks. How could you address the issue of economy of compassion? For instance, when the suffering of some are rendered more appropriate, while some could be considered not urgent and therefore repressed by the individual. How is this economy formulated? Why the sorrow is diversified and ranged by the third parties when the traumatic case is made public? I don't know, I don't quite understand this last part, why the sorrow is diversified and ranged by the third parties when the traumatic case is made public. Uh, Evgenia, are you here? Could you say something? What do you mean by this? Hmm. No, she's not. Um, is there is anyone uh, wants to respond to the economy of compassion? I, I'm not sure I understand the question exactly. Um, but it, it it goes a little bit to what Arrest was saying, you know. Is that? I thought uh, I, I, I was thought, uh, uh, answered at uh, at that question. <laughs> yes. Okay, you answered that question, I think. Okay, let's go to the next. I'm sorry, Avgenia, if we don't cover each time your question. Let's go to the next question here. Bogdan Orishkevich. Dr. Maran speaks of a shared purpose and goal as a therapeutic strategy. Russians, not Ukrainians, speak of being burnt by the sun as the collective trauma of Stalinist totalitarianism. I would be honored if you would read my essay and idea for a constructive tool that would give a sense of purpose and global reconstruction and solidarity, not just Ukrainian reconstruction. There is a quote here of the essay. I have an implementation strategy for schools, which is not included. I have experience and success in graded responsibility. The most toxic environment in the Donbass can collect the energy and resources of its own cleansing and renewal. Every place on the sun can collect solar energy in solidarity with Ukraine, Pakistan, and Somalia. Even individual Russians can collect solar energy in solidarity with Ukrainians. Thank you for reading this. So there's, you can see that in the, in the chat. Um, there is Evgenia who responds, she can speak, but she can type. So please do type Evgenia. Could, there is turn, another question. We can, turn Evgenia's, we can turn Evgenia's microphone on, I think, um, if she we're wants already, to. We're already enabled. Um, you already uh, wrote? Yes, if you, if you want to unmute yourself, you can do it. Perhaps she's not able to do for other reasons. Okay, let's go to the next question. Uh, question by Shriya Malhotra. There seems to be so many ongoing crises that daily life needs more emotional resilience building for people. And yet most people are resistant to therapy and the idea, how could it be normalized? Question mark. <laughs> Ole, why don't you? Uh, because it's a very, 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 it's a good question. <laughs> uh, and uh, to answering the question, we would help a lot of people. Uh, provide, if you will provide space and love, love in the broad way of this, yeah, and we would uh, raise the trust and people would come without the availability of service, yeah, structurally speaking without having a good therapist, psychologist, doctors, nurses in the hospitals and primary facilities, medical, in schools, 
uh, we will not uh, be uh, uh, we will not raise the trust to 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 the to the to, to our services. That's why we have to disseminate uh, uh, spaces. Yeah, that's why it's very simple to open psychiatric ward and uh, mental health center, outpatient mental health center in every hospital in Ukraine. It's no big money. And, uh, uh, but, the, but this is, that's what, and, and then providing, studying, learning, we would, we would be more, more um, useful for people. And people will use this instrument. Um, of uh, of um, to overcome the resistance. Uh, the resistance is uh, uh, okay. Well, I think that that, that there you know there have been movements within psychiatry within the history the anti anti psychiatry movement etc. To sort of question the the uh, uh, structure of power related to giving diagnoses, uh, pathologies, DSM, et cetera, et cetera. But I would like to, I mean, that's for sure one, one way to go with this question, but another way is perhaps even more uh, effective in the end, and that goes back to what Stephen said in terms of the predictors for successful um way to to step out of the traumatic uh, uh, overwhelming situation and that has to do with the support given by the family and friends and next next of kin and neighbors which i think um, are already visible also in ukraine the movement uh, and the degree to which people help each other. And of course, that helping each other is often happening more on the material level and the speaking with each other is because of the trust issues more difficult. But it seems that uh, uh, one would need to think in the direction of, of uh, developing a culture where uh, people within families can to a certain extent, uh, speak about their traumatic experiences. So I, I would just add again that concretely, um, the issue of um, the stigmatization, uh, that, that the, where the message comes from and how uniformly the message is delivered matters. And so that when there are huge numbers of people who are impacted by similar circumstances, what we have found is that people have more tools when they have concrete information that describes and articulates common experiences of, of uh, traumatic stress, as well as very down to earth steps that can be taken that can support members of one's family and members, uh, and members of one's community as friends. So uh, again, I know I'm repeating myself, but the dissemination from government resources can be enormously helpful in terms of giving basic information, not only about what ails you, what may be troubling you, but about steps that can be taken that can ameliorate some of the disruptive and painful uh, symptoms of that distress. And again, uh, as normal phenomena, not as psychiatric phenomena. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps we can ask uh, Ole and Orest, how do you take into consideration when individual patients present themselves to your hospital, how do you take into consideration what's going on in the family? Do you actually conduct interviews with family members? Do you follow up when there is a, an issue that comes up in relation to the family or family members? How do you work with that? Um, it's, it's no question about this. It's a necessity, uh, actually, in, in our situation and in our style of working. Yeah. Uh, first of all, usually now, at this moment, uh, all patients, and especially the military one with the PTSD from our area, was directed to our services by the families member. 
they were not come to us by themselves. They come, they came in the company of uh, father, uh, father-in-law. Uh, I'm just I'm taking that from the list. Uh, wife, uh, friend, um, the friend who used to have such experience already successful. So it's uh, absolutely this case. Um, uh, yes, we have a patient in the hospital who were brought by the medical trains and uh, there's no relatives around. And as I said in my, my opening remarks that uh, usually they are not talking about their mental problems. And you have to reach out to them asking about this. And when you ask, you already have a response. Uh, usually the first response is, has an aggression mode. So you don't understand, you will not understand. I don't need any help, but it's only initial remarks. After a few minutes of patient hearing, you would have a question what to do. So, um, um, and usually at the first interview with the patient who came from the, uh, by the medical trains from the East, military or civilian. The first, one of the first question is, do you have a, some connection to your relatives now? Uh, do you need telephone uh, that you can call or do you have it or, and the sadness, the sad moment is if the patient say, no, I don't have a relatives you know, because of tragic event. And uh, it is like a cases. So it's a, I think it's a just necessity. Uh, without this, it's very difficult to treat, very difficult to help. And some, uh, uh, in one case, uh, the, 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 the wife came with their husband and they, they, they communicate together. And after a few days, she came alone and said, I have to talk to you, doctor. I said, listen, I don't wanna talk to you without your husband because it's very important for me that you're gonna trust me. And she said, okay, I'm gonna come with him. And, and she said to me with him, listen, I sent my husband to war and now I received the warrior, but not my husband. <laughs> it's kind of very difficult question what to do, no, what to, to, to answer. Yeah, because there's really war change all of us and especially those who, who, who were there on the front line, so. Thank you. There is another question that I would like to pick up here uh, by Vasil Cheripanin to all panelists. How to deal with trauma when its cause is not over, but quite the opposite, constantly ongoing without any end in sight. Well, it's, I think this question is, is very important because it, of course, concerns the current context in Ukraine where the trauma is ongoing and where it, there is no end in sight, even though we do speak about reconstruction. And yesterday there was uh, one panelist who also problematized this notion of reconstruction as something that she felt she could not quite subscribe to because she didn't see where the the beginning point should be. Um, and I think this question of ongoing trauma is uh, especially in the areas where the war is so much more active than in Lviv, uh, the East, uh, many, many other localities, um, is a huge challenge because the, the, the ongoing threat of bombings, of destruction, of persecution, of abduction and so forth is a reality, not only for the people who are actually being wounded and who come to the, the, uh, to the psychiatrists and the doctors in the hospitals, but also to, of course, the whole healthcare personnel themselves. 
And so um, I'm not sure there is a different way of, uh, of approaching the work because even when one is being threatened for the people who choose to stay or who have to stay, uh, and I don't particularly feel qualified to answer this question myself because I've never worked in a direct context of war, that is to say under direct threat of my own person. Um, so maybe or Orest or Ole, you would have to speak to this because yeah. you, you know, the trauma have, is of course ongoing. I have uh, two responses. Uh, one from the example. Uh, at a military guy who had a very, very severe combined combat trauma, surgical uh, and, uh, and psychological. And, uh, and he had a, uh, the, the attacks of, of uh, anxiety when the air alarm is, was on. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, he said what to do uh, and said to, to him, listen, if the air alarm is on, you should go to the shelter. And, uh, um, and after a few months, uh, after discharging him from the hospital, we accidentally saw each other on the street. And said, Dr. Borizuk, you know, thank you very much. You know, I'm so happy that I see you because I want to thank you because you treat me. So how come? Listen, now when the alarm is on, I'm always going to the shelter. Mm -hmm. And my anxiety, it's much better. I'm working there and that's fine. So the, the moral from this example is during the war, we have to follow the rules which is applied in war. The rules which help us to survive in fr on front line or in the home. Yeah. Uh, and the second, I would paraphrase the William Shakespeare, let trauma or grief or sorrow talk. We okay. have to share our uh, trauma trauma experiences and emotions yes. even though it's not yes. easy thank you very much thank you all the panelists for this very interesting moving uh, important discussion we have to stop here and let the next panel uh, come into there into this space thank you all thank you thank you very much Thank you, Beatrice. We're going to start the next panel in four minutes. It's a short break before it. Thank you.
Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, Marianne. Hi. Um, so we're turning to the second round table of the day, which is titled War and the Arts of Witness. Um, it is co-moderated by Laura Wexler, who is the professor of American studies and women, gender and sexuality studies at Yale University. And Marian Hirsch, a professor emeritus of comparative literature and gender studies at Columbia University. Um, Laura and Marian and the renowned photographer Susan Maselas held a course last semester around image and war at Yale University, uh, which was titled The Photographic Image and War. And it's my honor um, to pass the mic to you, Marian. Well, let me just um, also say we, we divided it the other way. <laughs> yeah, I, want to, I just want to say welcome to everyone for coming to the panel and thank Marta Kuzma and the organizing committee for the exceptionally deep and um, important and profound gathering that we're participating in. We thank you very much. Um, we have um, a, a, a panel um, that is about the art artists of witness in the midst of war. And um, I'm going to uh, transfer to my colleague, Marianne Hirsch, who will introduce some of our thoughts about what this roundtable is about. Thank you, Laura, and thank you also to everyone for convening this amazing um, set of discussions about um, the reconstruction of Ukraine. So uh, we've already had uh, a few preliminary conversations with the artists participating in our panel. And the question that we pose to them is, can art convey the experience of war in the midst of this occurrence, uh, of its occurrence? And we asked them to use one example from their work in these very short five minute presentations to tell us about the interventions they are making right now. Uh, we asked them to think about what audience they have in mind for their work, what genre or form they have chosen and why. And we are wondering whether they see their work right now as a form of bearing witness, as a form of judgment, as a form of social critique, of accountability, of memory, possibly of healing and redress. And as we were speaking uh, with each other um, in preparation, we also understood that um, this moment of being in the midst of destruction and devastation of trauma is a very difficult one. And that there may be many topics that we can't discuss right now. And that we are very sensitive to trying to honor some of the silences and pauses and um, resistances to trying to be in conversation in this kind of international forum and being witnesses uh, for your compatriots and for our, some of us who are um, witnesses from the outside or co-witnesses from, from a great distance. Um, so this just by way of introduction, um, we're also sensitive to the fact that you've all been asked to speak um, in many different forums about these questions. So we're hoping that this particular panel will be a productive one and a fresh one for you. Um, it's, it's a great honor um, to present our speakers who are um, artists, independent artists, mostly based in, in Kyiv uh, in Ukraine. And we will begin with uh, Oleksii Radnitsky. Oleksii, uh, we're ready to hear from you. Hey, <clears throat> hello. Uh, thanks a lot for having me here. I hope you hear me well. It's an additional honor uh, for me to uh, be able to kick off uh, this series of interventions, even though I think I might not really abide um, to the framework that I was suggested, or at least maybe not fully. And uh, because actually before uh, talking about art, as a form of bearing witness, witness, I think it would be useful to actually ask ourselves uh, what are we in fact witnessing in Ukraine right now? 
And of course, on the one hand, it's clear that we are witnessing a kind of endless and numbing pile of atrocities that are committed uh, by the Russian Federation in Ukraine on a daily basis. And of course, since the very first days of the invasion, uh, the artists are responding to these atrocities uh, by creating work that represents the experience and trauma of uh, their victims primarily. And of course, I am not questioning the importance of this kind of work. And I myself uh, working towards exactly this as part of the reckoning project about which I would prefer not yet to speak at the moment. Uh, but I would also argue that art as a form of bearing witness should really not limit itself to the representation of war trauma and uh, destruction. Because this kind of limitation, I think, would uh, actually play into the hands of the perpetrator. In fact, uh, as the Russian strategy right now is actually to simply reduce Ukraine to the issue of war, yeah, and to bury it under this kind of a thick layer of representation of atrocities, and therefore to divert attention from a real question, like a real problem of this war. And uh, this problem is, of course, not really in Ukraine, it's with the Russian Federation itself. So I would say that what we are, in fact, witnessing also in Ukraine right now is a sign of a much bigger historical shift uh, than merely an invasion of a single sovereign state, yeah? And it seems that what we are witnessing right now are actually the death throes of imperialism, uh, the death throes of a uh, Russian uh, settler colonialist project, which is in fact nothing but a perverse copy of Western white settler colonialism. We really need to say goodbye to this illusion that the Russian Federation is somehow not part of the West, of the Western colonial project. The Russian Federation is simply all about white settlers exterminating the indigenous populations uh, and extracting fossil fuels from their lands, which is in fact a very Western way of doing things. And uh, to make things worse, the origins of this white settler colonial project are actually in Kyiv. Because this is where this genocidal eastward expansion of white populations, the white Slavs had started around, around a thousand years ago. And in that sense, I think Ukraine has a responsibility also with regards to countless peoples and nations that are currently oppressed in the Russian Federation. And our struggle is also a struggle for their liberation. And of course, art uh, that bears witness to this kind of historical shifts should not merely convey the immediate effects of wartime, yeah? Because art that bears witness to the collapse of empires is uh, one of the most powerful tools to also foster this collapse. And I would argue that artists in Ukraine are right now in a unique position to contribute, maybe not so much to the victory on the battlefield, but to the dissolution of the Russian Federation and the liberation of its peoples. Uh, we are in a quite unique position because in fact, we as subalterns of this empire understand the Russian imperial culture much better than many Russians themselves do. We know that for a lot of Russian artists, uh, the very colonial character of Russian culture is still very much a blind spot. While for us as uh, subalterns, it is kind of a reality that we were raised in. So yeah. our knowledge of Russian culture, uh, which we've received as part of colonial education patterns, will definitely be turned against uh, the Russian Federation itself. Uh, also, we as uh, subalterns are able to make much more advantage of the uh, use of Russian language itself than people in Russia. Uh, people in Russia, as we know, are even banned from using the word, the, the word war itself, right? And so as witnesses of this Russian disaster, uh, we are in fact in possession of every subversive tool that is needed to accelerate uh, the demise of the Russian Federation. And at the very least, we can even do this by merely introducing this idea, the idea of the necessity of this demise, 
into the global decolonial discourse where it was pretty much absent until very recently. Uh, for it is clear uh, to many of us that no reconstruction of Ukraine, speaking of reconstructions, no reconstruction of Ukraine would actually make any sense without a profound decolonization that is deconstruction of a neighboring empire that otherwise any, any reconstruction of Ukraine would be followed by a new wave of destruction at uh, sooner or later. Um, I think it's time for me to uh, finish uh, talking and hand over to the next uh, speaker. Thank you. Laura, you're muted. Hi, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Um, the next speaker is Irina Tilek. Tilek. Sorry. Tilek. And uh, she is a filmmaker uh, and an independent artist. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. As a filmmaker, I do actually both fiction and documentary films. And during last eight and a half years of Russia's war against Ukraine, various metamorphoses happened to Ukrainian cinema. Of course, fiction and documentary films use different tools to deal with uh, this new reality. And as to my opinion, documentary filmmaking is in a more advantageous position because, you know, fiction films need time and distance to somehow reflect on these current events. And also they need budgets. Uh, since this uh, Russia's full-scale invasion has started, the fiction filmmaking in Ukraine is almost paralyzed for obvious reasons. And documentary films also need budgets, but uh, it could work differently because, you know, when something extraordinary happens, you can grab your camera or even smartphone to fix this power of here and now. And um, the unique documents sometimes born in this way. So since 2013, we've been watching the bright process of uh, uh progress of uh, Ukrainian non-fictional films and it's not that easy to talk briefly about its aims and challenges and benefits because there are too many aspects that is the universe but I can highlight just few of them very fast. So first of all uh, documentary filmmakers document the reality and uh, if we are talking about the times of war some filmmakers become participants and witnesses of unique events and crimes and of course this footage can be used as some kind of the weapon in the informational war and we live in a time when gadgets are available for everyone i know some strong films shot with smartphones only but at the same time, there is a huge difference between successfully short materials and turning them into films because uh, it's different things. And as to me, the author's view matters. So the unique author's perspective actually turns uh, some footage into documentary films. So the other strong tool of documentary filmmaking is artistic reflection and actually that is the most interesting part for me of this uh, issue um, also documentary films become strong tools of the fight for human and civil rights and i had uh, some experience in my past i did uh, two films for the Cinema Almanac, which is called Invisible Battalion, about women who defend Ukraine. And thanks to this project and to public discussion about the violence of women's rights in the army, uh, the list of positions available for women in the Ukrainian armed forces was expanded. It happened in 2017, so that was a, quite a great experience for all uh, my colleagues and uh, also as to me documentary films are strong 
uh, tools of cultural diplomacy because these new films help us to open some new doors around the world and talking about my own experience few years ago i did uh, the film the earth is blue is an orange about civilians who live in the red zone in Donetsk region. And this film was quite successful and uh, it actually helped me to have uh, hundreds of dialogues with various audiences around the world. And also these screenings uh, helped us to raise money for helping Ukrainians. So, I mean, it also matters. And while our colleagues, many Ukrainian artists, filmmakers, writers defend the country with weapons in their hands. We try to find on informational and cultural field. So these are just few aspects and I hope we will have a chance to talk more. So thank you. And I can give a pass to my next colleague. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irina, for these really wonderful reflections on the importance of documentary and what documentary can do. Our next speaker is Mikola Ridney, who is an artist filmmaker um, from uh, Kiev. Mikola. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to take part in this panel discussion with you. And uh, I would love to start with the claim that Today, wars, and particularly uh, the war in Ukraine, are the wars of images. And I would like to talk about the problem of uh, representation of war and the image of violence and how it is challenging artistic practice today. In other words, um, the question is how to talk about violence and not to repeat, aestheticize, and multiply it. Uh, because the military strategies um, uh, and tactics, uh, uh, there are committed war crimes, loss of uh, human lives and destruction of infrastructure, but uh, the image of war, it's always uh, more than just a report or um, documentation. Uh, the images of war exist in uh, competition. Uh, they're laying in a frame of informational and uh, media battlefield. Uh, and uh, the accessibility to visual information today in the form of uh, various live streams, uh, video blogs, uh, thematical social media channels uh, doesn't really bring us uh, closer to the event and understanding of uh, its context. Um, uh, as uh, <clears throat> artist Hito Style wrote once, uh, the more immediate uh, documentary uh, images become, the less there is to see. The closer to reality we get, the less intelligible it becomes. Uh, manipulation with the images is a part of informational war, whereas one and the same image uh, could be shown with opposite meanings. Uh, there is significant example of that with Malaysian Boeing MH17, uh, which was shot by a Russian big separatist in the sky over Ukraine. Russia was and still uh, denying the accusation. And in 2000, since 2014, uh, Russian propaganda were actively sharing the images of the catastrophe claim in Ukraine uh, in the plane crash. Uh, the, Images which are directly showing the violence or gore are affective, and uh, but in some way they are also effective uh, in order to change um, attitude of societies, politicians, countries to certain problems. Uh, uh, Jacques Rancière once said that uh, in this sense, representations uh, may be realities in themselves. And I think this is true in that sense that uh, images can change the reality. The images of Bucha uh, massacre uh, committed by Russian soldiers to Ukrainian civilians in the beginning of the invasion this year uh, shaped the whole world and uh, some political decisions in the direction to support Ukraine uh, in the war were made uh, particularly uh, after that. Uh, 
But uh, the question is, uh, what do we feel after seeing such images? Uh, compassion towards victims uh, with time transformed to hatred uh, towards, uh, towards persecutors. And uh, of course, there is nothing good about such emotion as uh, hatred. In the case of um, violent conflict, it leads to more and more uh, escalation, uh, creating a, a circle of violence. But in relation to Bucha images, uh, we cannot view um, Ukrainian and Russian reaction from equidistant uh, position. Uh, the emotion of hatred uh, emerged among Ukrainians towards Russians is the emotion of victims towards aggressors. The emotion of Russians uh, towards Ukrainians is the emotion of victims of myths and propaganda. That also raises the question how innocent is the victim of myth and is innocent at all. Russian society is a victim uh, of myth, became its supporter, and uh, even, uh, even co creator. Uh, let me share the screen at this moment. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> what uh, um, what artists can say, what the imager, imaginary can use uh, in this regard. Uh, in, uh, in a number of works uh, realized over the last eight years, I addressed the question of uh, vision uh, in the context of reality affected by political calamity and war. And I borrow the uh, visual language of ophthalmology to use the metaphor of blindness to describe social dehumanization. The blind spot, which is also the title of the work you see on the screen, is a small area on the retina where the image is created. To complement it, we rely on our own knowledge and memory without taking into account that we are consciously constructing reality. During the disease, the blind spot can be perceived by a person from the small spot to the total darkness that fills the eye. Blind spots appear not only in ophthalmology, but in the digital navigation of our reality, including reality of war, when uh, I mean when the certain spots are blurred uh, for political reasons. In this work, I use this concept as a metaphor to a society in a state of media war. It's a critical statement of uh, mechanical, <clears throat> on the mechanical following the reality designed by the media and social blindness imposed by the propaganda of war, which creates polar vision of our reality, it's dividing societies and communities. So what I would like to point out at the end, um, that um, Ukrainian society is not only a victim, but a, a hostage of a circle of violence today. A hostage uh, that is held captive uh, for a long time, uh, because this war is something which will be with us for a really long time, unfortunately. Uh, hostages start to be adopted to existence in violent environment and normalize it, used to be with it, live through it. And I think this is um, uh, a problem uh, from the perspective of the future, which I suppose we are all imagining as peace and related idea of uh, reconstruction we are talking about today. Okay. At this point, I would love to, to pass the word for the next speaker. Thank you. Okay, thank you very, very much for showing us that and sharing these ideas about the blind spot and taking a hostage of affect and effect. The next speaker is Alvatina Kakist, who is a, also an artist um, working in Ukraine. 
Uh, hello, thank you so much for the platform. Uh, at the moment, I'm in Sweden, having a bit of retreat, but in February, March, in beginning of April, I stayed in Kyiv region, and it's appeared that uh, I was under shelling, and all the places I just uh, mentioned, like Buch, is not far from me. My village was like five kilometers from the Russian tanks, Russian troops, which were stopped. And in the first day of uh, whole scale invasion, I decided to be in my place, not to run away. And it's interesting that before, from 2014, I was describing the same story and actually it was my mom who appeared to be in occupied territory in Jdanivka, like 56 kilometers from Donetsk. Her city became occupied in April 2014, and she also didn't leave her house, her garden, her life, whatever. So I'm like, good girl, good daughter of her mom. And since I was uh, reporting what is her life is about in occupied territory, I used drawings and texts when the invasion started, I didn't invent something new. I did the same. So being in Muzici, this is the name of my village, not from, from Kiev, 26 kilometers, like less kilometers from Bucha in Irpin, I was reporting, posting the images in internet, even when the electricity was cut off, I could use my mobile coverage connection to do that. So my images appeared in many magazines, journals, and newspapers over the world. And I also appeared on some TVs and also took uh, simply video messages or something like this and was placed in uh, different uh, media and platforms. But then I went to Venice for Venice Biennial to be in in the frame of presentation of Ukrainian pavilion. And then I saw Western society and could make this uh, understanding how world is about. And then when I understood this and realized that I like to go home and fail 360 camera or something like this. And so I produced the film in Irpin in June. And this film was presented in uh, International Biennial in Manifesto 14 in Kosovo. And this is film was so much about Ukraine, what I mean. When you use um, 360 uh, degree camera that you can see, for instance, something in front of you, it's ruin, and then you turn right and it's something else. Kids can play and you turn more and it's something else. For me, this is a metaphor of Ukraine because basically what I'm doing with my art, with my text, with my images, and also with this movie, I'm describing practice of this world. What is the reality of this world? Because most of the questions to me, it's like, do you really pay tax? Are the stores are working? And of course, I explain many types of dangers in Ukraine, which is one danger is occupied territory, it's something else. Another danger, the front line, where some of my friends also with the arms. It's another type of danger. Then the third one is actually um, that it could be spontaneous missiles in any place of Ukraine. And if you decide to be in Ukraine, you're in a risk. And then the last one is economic issue, which is also important. So time to time, I really feel kind of ashamed that I produce art because it's luxury to produce art, as I feel. And why it's luxury? From one hand, it's like I can do it. If I'm, let's say, in Ukraine, it means I'm alive. And it's uh, thank you to the people who are in the front line. And secondly, why it's look luxury? Because when you produce art, is actually uh, you're so much in distance because you can't produce art or something when you don't have it. And when you have a distance uh, with your art, you're absolutely not a victim at all. You're a bit far from the subject. And this is, gives amazing opportunity for artists uh, to be a bit above of the situation. But of course, we are still humans. We still feel 
and this is her time. And I have one drawing, which is the, something like a timetable of Ukrainian. In the beginning, you cry, then you work, then you cry, then you're proud. You also can proud of your, not really, I can't say exactly what it's about. It's like you're really connected. doesn't matter where you are. For instance, I'm in Sweden, but I'm still very connected. And I'm so happy to see all my colleagues here presented. And I really like every day I'm checking news and in chat with many people, with my family. And so this is what we are proud because we are really connected. Thank you so much for me to give a speech. And I really give this platform for other people to spread their ideas. And so thank you. Thank you so much, Aleftina. Um, also about speaking about distance and the luxury of producing art. I know we'll be talking about this uh, in the discussion. Um, the next and our last speaker is Nikita Kadan, uh, who is um, an artist based in Kiev. And uh, Nikita, please let me know when you want me to share the screen with your images. Um, I think Nikita keep it muted. Yeah, and now? Now, yes, yes. It's so, okay. Uh, I'm an artist based in Kyiv, but now I'm speaking uh, from Kassel uh, and I recently participated uh, in a workshop in a documenta for like people, let's say, from outside of Western world uh, who run different uh, like, uh, spaces, uh, different sorts of artist run initiatives. And uh, I'm here because I got a short term permit to leave. And uh, as you may know, like people of male gender cannot uh, leave uh, Ukraine now, except of like sportsmen and uh, sometimes uh, cultural workers who get these short term permits from, uh, from the ministry. And uh, this is uh, really a sort of uh, privilege uh, which. Um, you have to reflect and which somehow gives you a yeah, feeling, uh, feeling of guilt. And uh, after documenta, I'll go to visit my daughter who is uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands in Maastricht with her mother. And uh, okay, I know that uh, plenty of uh, men of other occupations just uh, don't have such an opportunity being in the same situation. And uh, like, yeah, you, you can imagine. Uh, uh, anyhow, I am here and uh, it's a possibility to go on uh, with my practice because uh, you know, in Ukraine, uh, we hardly can uh, like make our living from art under war conditions. And uh, yeah, the situation of uh, lots of people of say non-essential occupations, uh, is uh, also really, really problematic. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, when I was invited, uh, actually, I thought what can be like special about my contribution and uh, as a uh, rather personal of, you know, making uh, visual material artworks uh, like harasses and uh, making a uh, text being verbal i decided to show one artwork which somehow like maybe representative of what i do or concentrate certain meanings which uh, i feel you know maybe even obliged to share and uh, i would like to show you this work uh, victory uh, please tell me when, uh, oh, yeah, you do it. Uh, so there are several photos and you can uh, slowly show them one by one. Maybe, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, 
Uh, so this is a sculpture from 2017, which has uh, two two elements. One is a white geometric shape, which repeats the sketch of unrealized monument from 1926 monument to three revolutions by Ukrainian Kharkiv constructivist artist Vasily Yermilov, one of key figures of Ukrainian avant-garde of mainly 1920s. This uh, sculpture, which wasn't realized in public space, there were only a few drawings and uh, one small uh, like table table scale model. Uh, it is known as monument to three revolutions and sometimes as a monument to three Russian revolutions. Uh, so it's about uh, so-called Decembrist uprising against Tsarism in the uh, 19th century. It's about uh, February revolution and October revolution of 1917. And uh, other element of the work uh, is some item which was three ceramic cups, but now they are connected together and covered partly by melted glass. And I found those cups in the ruins of house in a city of Lysychansk in 2015. Now Lysychansk is occupied and terribly destroyed. Then how lots of houses were destroyed and damaged and uh, yeah, there were lots of victims. Now there are plenty of victims. Uh, so I take an object from history and from art history, transforming it to this very, you know, sterile, clean, cold, white model. In original Yermilov's piece, it was gray and black and red. So I made it white. I take a work for public space, which never was realized as such, which never in fact existed as artists invented it, as uh, he planned it. And I take a monument to revolution. And other element is material evidence. The item I take from ruins. You know, now I uh, call the things I do, especially those which contain elements of rubble, elements of ruined houses, elements from destroyed apartments, elements of, you know, ruined environments of human lives and non-human as well. I call them evidence sculptures like a, like a term evidence sculpture or a general direction of what I do can, could be called like poetics of material evidence and uh, if uh, in the beginning of the war in 2014 I was oriented towards, you know, making the war history, making war history as soon as possible, taking the element which, you know, testifies about the war and putting it to museum vitrine, you know, turning war history immediately, urgently. And uh, it was anyhow oriented towards some idea of a historical museum, which will contain all the wars, all the politically motivated violence, and uh, you know, will protect us from it. 
but put it into into vitrine, into the storage, into archive. We'll separate it from, you know, what we can call like real life, normal life. But now I am oriented to idea of evidence and the court institution, the judgment, the judgment of history, the court of history. Now, when we are in situation of just everyday mass killing of Ukrainians, in situation of genocide committed by fascist regime of Russian Federation, You know, my practice uh, turned to the idea of court and judgment. And uh, I guess it doesn't have to be like in future. It's not really about Den Haag. It is about this attitude towards new fascisms, new militarisms, through the idea of court procedure going here and now, even while they are active, even while their representatives are in this, uh, you know, like big political structures, when they are involved in global economic relations, even partly involved in global cultural relations. No, anyhow, they are under the legal procedure. The court is really, really going on here and now. And I consider my work uh, as a very, very special kind of evidence, which is anyhow present in historical context, in cultural context, in artistic context, but you know, doesn't have a distance from this space of uh, daily killing. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Nikita, and everyone who have spoken to us. We, um, as moderators, we are going to ask the listeners, the audience, to ask questions and actually maybe say a couple of questions ourselves first to start the discussion going. But I have to say to you that um, I've never been so silent as a moderator as I feel on this panel, um, because I would much rather listen to you than to speak. And the reason why is because although I have been a scholar of art and photography, although of memory, um, Marianne has spent her life career studying trauma and the Holocaust, and we have academic credentials for this. Um, what I learned from you is uh, not only the uh, very challenging and interesting art that you're making, but the, the slivers around the framing of your work that really enter me because you say things that are different from what I ever expected that you would say. So for instance, the idea that making art is a way of thanking the people on the front lines who uh, have uh, made it possible for you to be alive and making the art um, or the framing in terms of the global uh, decolonial anti-center settler colonialism uh, struggle in which uh, you uh, uh, described that this what's going on, the struggle in Ukraine is, is part of that struggle, not a perspective that we get about it basically from the United States. And, and so um, there's a, the, the gap that the distance that you have all spoken about um, uh, it, that somehow is material for you, it seems like in how you imagine it uh, as a blind spot or a delay or a, di dis a, a difference between fiction, film, and documentary. Um, but there's also the gap and the distance between those who are um, it, it, their ways of loving life are being 
ripped away at the very moment that you're working. And those of us that are trying to moderate conversations from the outside, I just say, um, that's all I, I, my question is how can I hear, how can I hear, how can I hear more of, uh, You've been speaking to people for many years, all of you. You're continuing to. You have said to us when we met with you that it's important, um, and I agree, but it's important uh, to change how we moderators hear uh, what you want to say. So I just really, I don't, it's a comment to start the discussion. Marianne, do you have something that you want to say? Well, so many things. First of all, thank you for these really thought-provoking um, interventions, really, of letting, in, let, letting us all into your thinking. And I'm wondering also if you would like to speak to each other about some of the things you've said. But um, my main question right now is follows on Laura's, which it has to do with the question of audience. And I think the blind spot, as um, Alexi first um, uh, raised it, and then also Mikola, has to do with different audiences of your work and the very different perspectives that a Russian audience would have as opposed to a Ukrainian audience, as opposed to a, an international audience uh, like the, you know, the large one on the screen today. Um, and so they, it seems to me they're, they're different blind spots. And I was wondering if we could talk a little bit, first of all, about the, that very arresting image of the blind spot, which is a little bit like macular degeneration, um, and which, which in Mikola's work has to do with how we represent violence and how, you know, violence, rep the representation of violence directly um, turns uh, Ukrainians into victims and the blind spots that are needed to not do that. But then also whether this idea of, 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 not, of what we don't want to see um, it could be um, could be developed, and I wonder if any of you would like to respond to to this this question of audience following on Laura's as well. And also, please uh, for the audience, uh, please put your questions into the Q and A. Maybe I have a few words to say about the audience, especially the communication with the audience in this particularly difficult time because uh, uh, my experience of last uh, six months uh, showed that, uh, first of all, it's very difficult to continue making any art because um, I think uh, the word distance was um, said a few times uh, in this discussion. So it's hard to find this distance while you are, we are basically in, uh, in the middle, of, in the core of this um, situation. But anyway, um, my experience of showing works, um, uh, first of all, talking about films to the audience in Ukraine and outside Ukraine is very different because um, um, in Ukraine, uh, I think people more or less sharing the same position uh, about the war and ongoing situation. So. Uh, the representation was important in this sense that it had sort of um, therapist uh, effect, I would say. Uh, it was uh, more important to have people gather together to discuss the situation we all appeared and compare the experiences. While outside of Ukraine, you still need to argue people a lot because the perspective of the perspectives to the political situation is still very different. And even among the intellectuals and the culture field, you can find sometimes really strange opinions uh, about the war in Ukraine. So uh, in a sense, um, on international level, uh, culture is a little bit like a battlefield in this sense. Any, would anybody else uh, like to follow up on the question of audience, any of our other speakers? I was very struck, Gideon, now watching your film, uh, how, you know, in the, uh, the earth is blue as an orange. At the end of the film, you're showing the film to a local audience um, yeah. and, and they respond. And that struck me as very different 
than how I saw it in my living room in New York. But, you know, talking a little bit more about this experience of making this film, I was listening to my colleagues and especially to Aleftina, who told very special words for me that artists should be somehow above the situation. And also Mikola told the same. And uh, I remember the moment when I found myself uh, in the middle of the situation when I'm completely speechless and powerless. And uh, that was a moment when the full-scale invasion has started and I saw my child who was shaking of animal fear because we were listening to very loud sounds of explosions so close to our house. And suddenly I found out that I put on the shoes of my character, the protagonist of my film. But when I was observing her and her children, I had completely different perspective. I was the observer. So I had had a huge empathy and I could make my movie about them. But when I became that mother who is responsible for the, for the kid and who can't protect my kid of all these traumatic experiences, I suddenly understood that I don't have any uh, words, any ways, any instruments to talk about uh, this situation. So... Um, uh, yeah, we need distances and talking about the audiences. Um, I was quite silent half a year and I found only one way of uh, dealing with my own trauma. I started to write essays, essays for foreigners because actually some media proposed me to reflect uh, somehow in the form of essay and it helped me suddenly because, you know, that was some kind of a new dialogue with people from distant worlds. But when I was trying to explain them, what are we dealing with? It also helped me to see the situation with some other optics, some other eyes. And uh, talking about filmmaking experience, I started to develop the new project and I really want to try... Uh, the genre of animated uh, documentary. It's something really new and challenging for me. And I'm a big fan of Wals with Bashir, if you know this film by Ari Folman. So that was his way to deal with his trauma. And uh, as to me, that is one of the most honest ways to talk about our personal experiences. I mean, animation. And um, so, yeah, that is a long conversation and probably I'm trying to tell about different things <laughs> at the same time. So, yeah, all of us, we are all trying to find the best instruments, yeah, how to reflect. But sometimes it needs time, years probably to find the proper one. Okay, thank you. I, I think unless there's somebody else from the round table that also has something to say at this point, um, I'm going to uh, read the first question from the question and answers from Maxim Kodak. Do you think that maybe this is a moment to try to return the power of art that modernist art has contained? Sounds like constrained. Seems like we all agreed that modernist thinking drove us to all terrible genocides of the 20th century. But maybe in the modernist war, as this war appears to us to be, it's time to rethink the hidden and excluded power of art within that earlier discourse. We should try to think perhaps what art can do on the battlefield and directly after the war not just documenting the war and being the medium of witness, et cetera, but really on the battlefield and how can it directly affect the war? Thanks to all speakers in advance. A number of you have cited the battlefield, the battlefield of art. I think this question is asking you to th tell us more about the battlefield itself, if you would. If I may, 
I, I would say that uh, I do believe in metamodernism when artists do have uh, feeling to behave or act as modernist, but with the postmodernist attitude, when you are not so ambitious, you are not so big, but it's still you are ready to take or carry responsibility for the things. For me, metamodernism is something new, and I really, really believe this is the time for it. Mm. This is my short remark. Something new that's so interesting. Um, Alexi, yeah. Yeah, um, I really like the, this question, actually. Thank you, Maxim. I agree this is a modernist war in the sense that it's a very much 20th century war, yeah? Because the Russian Federation has gaslighted uh, a lot of us into thinking this war is going to be something very technological, very postmodern, kind of a cyber kind of bullshit and so on. But then it turns out it's almost like uh, the First World War in its strategy. And I think it's not by chance. Yeah, it's uh, this kind of conservatism and fascism in the Russian regime is so deep rooted that it kind of re <coughs> reproduces very conservative uh, ways of doing things on every level, even on the battlefield. And so in this sense, we have this war has kind of dragged us into the very deeply into the past in some sense, and maybe it's kind of illuminating what Maxim is suggesting to kind of revive the idea of the modernist artist that is going to revive itself anyway. I mean, if we, again, I'm, I'm gonna talk about uh, decolonization again, but if we look at the way the Russian empire was kind of taken down, uh, the way that the Russian empire stopped to exist, it was actually almost, to, to a very big extent, taken down by intellectuals, artists, and writers. And I don't only mean those who were participating in the revolution, but I mean those who were preparing the demise of the Russian Empire for decades. Yeah, basically, all, like, every, like almost everyone we know as the so-called great, great Russian writer has contributed a great deal to the, the demise of their own empire. And I think this is definitely what is going to be happening again in the next years. But uh, I'm wondering, just as a follow-up to this, what about the war on images and the new technologies that certainly have taken this out of the modernist paradigms that Maxim um, wanted us to talk about? Mikola, you spoke about the war on images and then Irina and Alefina, you're both talking about graphic genres, uh, but which are more of the old fashioned ones, I guess, um, drawing. Uh, and yet we also have the internet as a weapon. Uh, yeah, I would say that, uh, <clears throat> well, it's, uh, I don't think that uh, the artists should uh, react uh, to this uh, overproduction of uh, images of war today because uh, the, the work of artists is something different, even uh, if not the opposite uh, to the work of the journalist. Uh, so in this sense, I agree with Alexei that maybe we have to look back to the past uh, and uh, not only in terms of decolonization, to talk about decolonization, but uh, as we are talking today about um, reconstruction mm -hmm. of Ukraine, so the past, um, we talk about reconstruction of Ukraine as something connected with the future, but in this sense, uh, past uh, is also the field which will which needs to be reconstructed in a way, because uh, it was used and uh, manipulated uh, by Russian propaganda a lot, uh, which lead uh, to lots of uh, substitutions um, of meanings. So. Yeah, and, uh, and also um, it's, it's really difficult uh, for me personally to react immediately to, uh, to the events of war because something new is going on every day. Uh, you, can't really, you can't really uh, react uh, with the same effectiveness uh, to that as journalists are doing. So in this uh, sense, art needs uh, more time uh, to come with reactions and conclusions. Okay. 
Um, maybe I'll just read a, a, a couple uh, more that actually are following up uh, on this question of hearing, witnessing of um, disparate framing. So Vera Sachenko says, it's not a question, but a comment. As a person in the center of empire, you can hear differently when you establish relationships with people from the periphery and systematically, not recreationally, get yourself out of the metropolitan bubbles. This is all the more challenging given that successful visible people from the periphery end up themselves internalizing and serving metropolitan discourses. A lot of work needs to be done for us all to actually hear each other. And Bairam Bairamali, I'm sorry if I've said that badly, but as a continuation, Bairam writes, as a continuation and of the continuation of the presentation of Oleski, Oleski, I wonder what can be the role of the transnational cultural sector on bearing witness to the war, given all these difficulties that we've said. What can be the role of the non-Ukrainian audience and spectators to unlearn and unthink Russocentrism and stop sanitizing settler colonial Russian history? I, I would also emphasize that question. What is the role? What, what, what is the role of the transnational cultural sector in uh, moving away from the settler colonial framing? Um, yeah, that's for me, right? Yeah, thanks a lot for this. And I think that um, this question is uh difficult but also simple at the same time because we can actually luckily we can now borrow methodologies from other decolonial frameworks uh right that are very much developed uh by now and one of those things is uh, starts actually with your own language yeah so uh, a lot has been done to decolonize um the language that we use with regards to the so-called uh third world or the so-called global south, maybe it's time to decolonize the language that is used with regards to our region. And the very first and maybe the most difficult thing to do would be to unlearn the phrase Russian avant-garde, right? It's gonna be difficult because this is one of the cornerstones of, of also Western art history, but it's completely wrong and colonial to say uh, the phrase Russian avant-garde, which never existed. In fact, it would be an insult to any of the av Soviet avant-garde artists to be called even that, because avant-garde movements were, of course, of course, post-national, right? They were anti-national. So uh, like every time you hear Russian avant-garde instead of Soviet avant-garde, you hear the deeply internalized colonial Russian discourse. And examples like that are a lot. So uh, transnational cultural uh, community or uh, how, whatever it's called, I think, you know, uh, you know what to do, really. Um, Marta Kuzma has a question. Marta, could you ask it live? Oh, okay, just a minute. Thank you, Mariana, and thank you to Laura, and, and thank you to all the artists participating in this panel. I wanted to, to take up what you just left off with, uh, Oleksii, which is not only relearn the avant-garde, you know, but also as devoid of nationalisms, but that actually very much took part in Ukraine, and Unovis was located in Kharkiv, actually. Um, where artists were rethinking how they could have an engagement with civic society, how they could reform and work with the government structures in creating another kind of thinking about anything from uniforms to procedures to uh, factory regulations to street signs. Yeah, And so in this period of time, I wonder whether if we look at back to work progress, works in progress administration from the United States in the 1930s um, or work art workers coalition what I'm hearing is that 
artists are now engaged in a civic responsibility to engaging in other aspects of the everyday in a highly militarized and conflictual zone. And so therefore there is still this pressure of the international art world to have you produce objects and things and things for exhibitions. But then you also have a pressure internally to serve as volunteers and to participate in as you are in sort of a documentary mode of um, giving testimony and evidence. Um, and it's this conflation, which is actually very interesting and has one of the more, you know, when you think of historical and critical movements in history, including the avant-garde, which was trying to create a new role for the artists outside of um, depicting or, or just producing the object. Is there something optimistic about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Somehow the word optimistic uh, provoked me to share a certain, uh, certain newest uh, uh, plans uh, of mine. Uh, not not the plans. Uh, it's already already happened. Uh, like uh, now, I. Uh, entered uh, an apartment uh, rented apartment in Bucha and I decided to do it for a few months maybe during the winter like autumn and winter or more I don't know not I don't know yet and maybe it will be like a format of residence or guest studio so place not only for myself and uh, it uh, has but it already has an aim uh, to research practices of returning to life. How places like Bucha after this terrible genocidal massacre or nearby like Irpin, Gastomel, Borodyanka, places of terrible devastation, how do they return to life? And, uh, you know, it's not only like uh, witnessing, uh, documenting, uh, it's being in, you know, artists, especially those who are close, personally close to what is going on in Ukraine. I mean, displaced artists, refugees, artists as well. They have uh, their own extremely valuable experience. Okay, for me, it's easier to speak from the point of view of one who stayed home, but uh, those who left, they have much to share. So we are Ukrainians between other Ukrainians. We are locals. We are people connected uh, with places we live. Actually, our experience is very similar to experience of lots of uh, no survivors and uh, those uh, whose uh, you know relatives uh, friends uh, might become victims like uh, I uh, knew personally people who were murdered in Bucha uh, and yeah, so just being in and participation in a process of returning to life using these special artistic tools related like to intuition, to metaphor, it's something very practical. You know, there are people who share it with volunteering. Okay, there is Yaroslav Futimsky. For me, it's maybe... Okay, for me, the most interesting performance artist in Ukraine, like connected with this very special, like poetry and performance um, direction. And uh, most of his time, he's just rebuilding houses in the villages in Chernigiv Oblast. And, uh, you know, there is something special about these places in the north central Ukraine, like in the area of Chernigiv. Russians still can repeat the effort to capture Kiev, entering through Belarusian border. 
and the north will be devastated again. So it's, you know, maybe building these uh, sand castles where the sea can uh, uh, no, destroy them in a few minutes. But it's practical activity. At the same time, it's poetic. Thank you, Nikita. This is very moving. And I think what, we're, what I'm hearing here is the the act of presence, of being present as an artist and of, and of accompaniment of um, the people in everyday life, um, not from not having enough distance, but the act of being present produces something, some form of witness that can communicate locally and, and, and more um, distantly as well. Um, I'm going to read the, la the, the last question that's in the Q&A, and if there are others, please post them, um, from uh, Adrian Ivanki. Thanks to Alexei for bringing up Russia's connection to white settler colonialism, as this raises <coughs> for me the question of what vectors, to use Svetlana Mativienko's term for ye of yesterday, are available to Ukrainians for the future. Svetlana mentioned two vectors of the war. An, an anti-imperial one, Russia versus West, and an imperial colonial one, Russia versus Ukraine. Neither of these offers much agency for the Ukrainian future. Fighting against an old colonial power will allow Ukraine to survive, but not to flourish. What if Ukrainians, artists especially, reached out along a third vector toward the colonized post-colonial world with its war traumas and extractivist sacrifice zones similar to Ukraine's? Might this allow for Ukrainians to play a key role in a more globally reconstructive project that could put ecological energy justice at its center? This is a beautiful question. Yes, indeed. Uh, thanks a lot, Adrian, for asking this question. Um, it's an honor for me to have you in the audience. And unfortunately, I, I had to miss uh, yesterday's panel with uh, Svetlana Matvienko, but we are having a lot of uh, conversations uh, with her on various occasions. And um, I think um, I disagree with um, at least the way that her argument uh, was, was voiced here uh, with regards to Russia versus the West. I think we should not give in uh, to this fake uh, uh, dichotomy that is that the Kremlin is trying to impose on us by kind of by pretending to not being the West. Yeah, I know it's painful for uh, the Western people uh, to accept. But, uh, yeah, it's painful for all of Ukrainians to accept, but Russia is the West. Like Russia is probably the most consequent uh, iteration of extractivist capitalist development that has been developed by the white settler colonialist project. So I, uh, I strongly urge to kind of drop this, uh, this dichotomy, this opposition, uh, Russia versus the West. There is no uh, war between Russia and the West. There is war between the fascist iteration of the West and uh, the liberal iteration of the West, whatever uh, this means. Yeah, and of course, uh, it's much more convenient for Russia to be framing uh, itself as some kind of obscure Eurasian, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But I'm sorry, Western people, uh, this is the West at its, at, its, at its most evil. But I agree, and, and definitely I agree with the uh, uh, second part of Adrian's statement uh, that uh, Ukraine uh, could have or uh, should have maybe not the key uh, role or function, but definitely should, uh, this war should be regarded in uh, one, one context with uh, anti-extractivist, anti-colonial struggles around the world, most importantly, uh, anti-extractivist and anti-colonial struggles that are happening in the Russian empire, in the Russian Federation right now, and of which we've heard very little, even though they really do exist. 
Thank you. Michal. Um, well, yeah, this has been an absolutely fantastic panel and all round table and um, so many thoughts, but I just wanted to quickly raise two, two words, uh, symbolism and realism, which perhaps are, especially the latter, are, are also forms of modernism or of some kind of metamodernism. And I kind of had this sort of impression that in the beginning, in the early months of the war, a lot of artists, or in the early weeks and months of the war, a lot of artists uh, who were being spread very widely on social media, especially were using symbols, very literal, very powerful symbols, very um, often. So people, uh, artists like um, Sanna shakhmuradova Tanska and um, artists like Katerina Ilisevienko were, were using easily recognizable kind of democratic symbolism to express very powerful, very profound um, experiences of suffering and of, 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 of wounding, but also of hope and of resistance. And it seems um, it seems that perhaps listening to, to, to what people are saying here today, what Alexi is saying, what Nikita is saying, what Mikola and, and, and others are saying, and th there seems to be this kind of like confidence that the 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 real things as they really are or a certain truth can be expressed through art so it's like there is a return there is some kind of realism um occurring this is purely my my kind of um perhaps false reading but i wonder whether that whether this word realism means anything some kind of some sort of militant realism or radical realism or, or resistant realism or resilient realism or realism of resistance some kind of um, whether in terms of what Nikita was describing this extraordinary project in Bucha, the, 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 the document showing life in its, in, its re, in its return, or with regard to Alexei's project, which uh, is about showing Russia in the condition of its inevitable disintegration or its inevitable decolonization, or rather hastening, the, hastening this process of decolonization. So I wonder whether these terms symbolism and, and realism mean anything or are, or are significant or, or, or perhaps not. Um, and I won't ask about propaganda because that's too, too much. And of course the project Nikita shows was all about symbolism. I would say uh, symbolism <clears throat> is directly linked to propaganda, which you didn't ask about, because uh, um, as I pointed out uh, already previously, um, there is a big substitution of meanings and uh, also related to political symbols uh, in this war. So in this sense, for me also, um, this war shifted uh, the previous meanings of the political uh, uh, left and right, uh, if you like, uh, because uh, uh, Russia is trying to use uh, all the um, leftist rhetorics, uh, but also um, uh, leftist design um, uh, in, their, in their propaganda uh, rooted with, uh, in fact, right-wing uh, and imperialistic uh, meanings. The same time, uh, uh, at the same time, uh, a popular topic in the uh, Western media, at least uh, before the invasion started, about Ukrainian uh, neo Nazis, also uh, completely changed uh, because we need to understand that. Uh, the symbols are not always um, equal uh, with the essence uh, of things. Because uh, let's say that the symbols of um, Azov uh, unit, which was often called as neo-Nazi unit, uh, is uh, very far from uh, the impact of the activity because uh, Azov unit became a defenders, but not the aggressors in this situation, defenders of particular, at least particular city of uh, Mariupol and uh, even victims in some sense, because uh, the city was almost destroyed and many of them died and uh, some of them been taken as hostages 
and then even a big number of them have been killed uh, as hostages. So um, I wanted to point that uh, um, talking about symbolism, I think we also need to talk about symbolism uh, or at least symbols corresponded towards political right and left. And uh, it's not really possible to uh, to follow these discourses in the same manner as it was before the invasion. So it's so interesting. Thank you. That the, the before the invasion and the after the invasion and the difficulty of speaking in the same manner. It's as, as if there's some huge shift in the before and the after, even though I'm sure you would argue that it's not a sudden um, it's not sudden, but I'm I'm struck by um, uh, Irina's uh, analysis of how it, fiction film is no longer possible to make in in Ukraine under these conditions because the apparatus of the, a fiction film can't be can't withstand with you know it's, can't be sustained. But you can grab a cell phone and you can document something and you, or you you can be in conversation with the moment it strikes me we're talking about a lot of different conversations conversation of the history of art conversation with the history of the russian empire conversation with uh one another in ukraine conversation with the transnational audience outside of ukraine and that, but that conversation becomes suddenly, in the way I hear what you're describing, immensely immediate. Suddenly, the tools of art, which are abstract in these conversations, become actual tools of living. The immediate, the the gesture of just take the cell phone in, or comfort the child, throw away the cell phone, or these these tools and what you do with them become very immediate. You're in conversation differently with the tools of art. And um, I wonder if this provokes any thoughts for you about the conversation we are having um, and its immediacy uh, or uh, the need to step back and think about what we're all, what we're trying to say and, and communicate. I, I wonder if we can, uh, I, I find that Irina's, metaphor of uh, grabbing the camera and uh, very, um, very provocative. Maybe you want to say something about that, Irina. Uh, sorry, I actually lost your conversation because I had problems with the internet and I lost something. And uh, in fact, um, I don't know, I found myself on the road where I don't have any new answers for the question that we are trying you know during the last eight years we return to these questions again and again how should we react on everything what is happening to us but in fact um, I failed I quit probably for some time I don't know and now I just need uh, some pause I'm on standby and I prefer listening to other people's stories. And uh, I want to be the observer again. I don't mm -hmm. want to be inside of the situation, in the center of all that events. Mm -hmm. So, But I still believe that all these discussions matter because uh, it's still important, you know, to ask questions, even if we don't have answers anymore. So you are right that... Uh, Sometimes it provokes us to think about. So I'm in the process of thinking. <laughs> okay. Yes, Alvatina. You're muted, Alvatina. Yeah, yeah, I do, I do, I do. Um, actually, from a certain moment, I understood that I have to allow myself to dream. To dream when the war is ended and has to be some scene. Otherwise, without dreams, I don't understand for what we do need victory over. This is my point, which I understood. I do draw a lot of dreams. For instance, one of my dreams that Ukraine can replace all fields of annual wheat with perennial wheat. This is my dream, if you know what it's about. It's so much to imagine that we can struggle with the climate crisis because perennial species don't produce so much of CO2 into into atmosphere. 
And till now, I do dream about this. Being in a cellar in a Kiev, I did this. And I was, uh, imagine even discussion, this Bruno Latour, mm -hmm. the philosopher, mm -hmm. who wrote that when he found out about the war in Ukraine, it happened that the same day this um, climate crisis report he received. And then he didn't know what is the tragedy, number one, the war in Ukraine or climate crisis report. But for me, of course, the war in Ukraine. But it's also so much about climate crisis. This is why I also dream to imagine the solution for many, many problems in the world and Ukrainians will be part of it to solve them. So I dream, I try to dream. Otherwise I can't really find myself in the right position. It's hard, but still I try. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Alexina. It's very moving. Um, there, there are a couple of really excellent questions still in the Q&A. Is there time to read them at least to um, just to raise them? Um, Dasha Michal, can you let us know? Yes? Yes. Okay. Well, the question of um, Alice Alexandrova. Although the war is an overwhelming experience that affects every single Ukrainian, but the intensity and perception of such experience is very different. How to prevent and avoid appropriation and parasitism of experience of the other, especially unintentional one in artistic reflections. If artists had an Hippocratic oath, how would it sound in wartime? The discussion was about healing and recovering effects of the art, but if we put it another way, how can we do no harm as artists? I think this is really important. And the second question is somewhat related, which is, is there room for satire as a mode of expression? Satire is propaganda, but it is also engagement and resistance. Uh, how to do no harm. Maybe we could have some closing thoughts on these two questions mm -hmm. from some of our panelists. Yeah, Nikita. maybe. Nikita. Yeah. Uh... Uh, yeah, I'll answer first, but then I would like to add something about symbolism because somehow it triggered me a bit. Think of about symbolism. Uh, yeah, and uh, about how not to do harm is actually one of most crucial questions uh, about uh, artistic practice now. And uh, I guess not to normalize things through art not to use these uh, standardized lenses of, uh, you know, international art in critical style. This international art system did a lot of, uh, you know, good things through uh, making uh, catastrophes uh, visible and discussed, but it made a lot of harm through turning these images of catastrophes into something normalized, something extremely conventional. And uh, if artist finds his or herself like in a um, say normal conditions of doing normal things uh, it's better to step back not not to do not to act uh, you know art of war time doesn't have to look like art of peaceful time if uh, you do like in any field or normalized critical art or no normalized like nationalist symbolist art uh, better not to. And uh, actually now I'm thinking about uh, lots of uh, Ukrainian artistic presence uh, in the world now and uh, about how it makes visible the catastrophe and how it really covers the catastrophe with the layer of banal symbolism. And uh, while you uh, called my work uh, like a uh, symbolic or symbolist, I would like to argue that, uh, you know, taking symbol 
and opposing it with an evidence is a way to do anti-symbol, way to, uh, you know, um, force the symbol to work against itself. When you take an evidence of war and put it over the model of unrealized monumental revolution, you reestablish relations between idea of revolution and reality of the war. Uh, actually, I really prefer this art which remains in the field of paradox, even when we are really sure that our struggle is like struggle for good against evil and that our struggle is struggle for survival for our you know essential right to live and how with our artistic expressions it's better to stay in a field of doubt and paradox because it's something special special contribution something we can add to a common struggle from our okay sorry for that but special unique nevertheless special artistic experience I think um, the state of doubt is a good place to end this really fabulous discussion. Um, and yes, um, thank you so much to all the panelists and uh, for this really amazing conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you all. And thank I you. hope we can stay in thank touch. You. We all have each other's emails now, so. Let's yeah. do it. Thank you. Stay in touch. Yeah. Thank you. And please share your work with us. Sure. <laughs> okay. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you. I think we're going on a break and the next round table starting at 4.30 London time and um, 6.30 Kiev time. Um, see you then.
Hello. Hello, my host. Hello. Before we start the next round table, I just wanted to briefly um, say that the building, rebuilding initiatives that was referred to in the previous round table, we have a list of them on our website um, and they could, there is information about them. They're rebuilding Chernihiv and other areas uh, right now in Ukraine. Uh, all information could be found there and please consider supporting them and learning more. Um, I, we will share a link in the chat. This round table is titled uh, The Past in Progress, Employing and Decentering and is going to be moderated by Michal Moravsky an anthropologist of architecture and cities. He is an associate professor of critical area studies at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies, University College London. Michal. You're muted, Michal. Um, thank you very much, Dasha, first um, moderator's uh, mistake. And um, welcome everyone, uh, welcome to our audience and, uh, and welcome to Sofia Kimberly uh, Mayhill, uh, and Yulia, uh, uh, thank you for joining us uh, today. I will just very briefly um, introduce the kind of broad topic of this uh, discussion, and then I'll hand over to Sophia, and I'll introduce each of you in turn as you as you speak. But as far as I understand from my comment, I feel also extremely awkward and uh, humbled to be moderating this panel because I'm not a historian. Uh, that's something I'm absolutely not. Uh, I've never been in a in a proper archive, uh, so I'm very kind of um, nervous about this discussion, and that's why I'm going to keep a low profile, I think. Um, but as far as I understand, the, this idea of employing the past that Sophia has suggested uh, in the title, this is something that is is very important. This this idea of the usability or the employability of the past. I've always, again, as a kind of amateur, been quite attracted to this idea, unfashionably attracted to this idea of usable pasts, which people ordinarily interpret in terms of some often is criticized in terms of its sort of extractive approach to the past. But actually, I think can also be represented in terms of thinking of the past as having a use value as opposed to having an exchange value or the past as being useful uh, in a way which is not an individualistic sense, but which has a kind of social use. Uh, so I think perhaps this uh, this the question of the employability of the past uh, and, and and how it's employed is is something that we will touch upon in various ways. And the other uh, core section of this title of the of this panel of this roundtable is refers to decentering, which I think in uh, Sophia's usage, perhaps, and correct me if I'm wrong, is kind of an umbrella term to refer to the very many Ds we have been um, applied and which have been dropped in discussions of uh, Ukraine's history and future and present uh, over the over, well for a long time, but in particular over the last few months, and which is most neatly and um, powerfully summarized in, I think, the working title of a commission called by Anton Drobovich, by Dr. Anton Drobovich, uh, who is the head of Ukraine's Institute for National Memory, the Commission for De-Russification, Decommunization, and Decolonization. Um, so how do those three ideas fit together? Um, do they jar with each other? Are they continuous with each other? Um, and how can we address and, and interpret them? Anton Drobovich uh, was, in, was, was invited to join us, but he is, as, 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 as most of us know, uh, as well as being the director of the Institute for National Remembrance, he's, he's, on the, he's fighting, he's in, the, he's in the Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, and so he has other concerns, much more direct concerns than, than, uh, than we do. So um, yeah, thank you to him for his for his um, for his contributions to 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 the future in in the most direct sense, but I thought I'd I'd um, I'd kind of mention the, the the name of this the, the this uh, this triple idea of what he calls critical decommunization, uh, and this triple idea this this play institutional placing together of decommunization, derussification, decolonization. Um, as a, as, a, as, a, as perhaps an illustrative, illustrative thing to guide the discussion. So I'll uh, hand it over straight away to 
um, uh, to Sophia. Uh, Sophia Diak is a, is a historian, is an urban historian as, and is the director of the Center for Urban History in Lviv and her, her full bio is pasted now in the chat. So thanks very much to all over to you, Sophia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michal. And um, I just want to update that the commission that you counsel, you mentioned, uh, didn't get that title in the end. So it actually was a uh, first uh, naming without um, certificate <laughs> or being official. Um, and what I would like to say is that in the end, I'm, I'm, I have to check immediately how it's precisely sounded, but it's like commission, it's a, it's, it's a council of um, overcoming the legacies of totalitarian. It's, it's more in that direction. Uh, later in the in the chat, I will paste it in correctly. And I think it also would, um, as, a, as a member of this council, going for Zoom meetings time to time than I can. It's also it's a, it's a, it's a diverse body of experts. Uh, I have to say that um, the name was um, chosen in elective process by voting and the help of Google. Uh, Google facilities, which I think it also uh, gives a touch that um, of understanding or maybe complication. So, but I want um, I want well on that, and for this my, my my shorter introduction, I would like to share some of the you know, professional and personal um, um, experiences, uh, and more in the format of something which is tentative and suggestion as suggestive. Uh, as avenues of thinking. So as we all observe, the war triggers intensive revisiting of previous experiences and narratives uh, about the past. And this revisiting is multidirectional. So we see how our present pushes us to ask new questions, looking for topics which resonate, think today, and turn to our knowledge of what was before as maybe helpful or not helpful in navigating our today and in a way charting possible tomorrow. And we are doing it again and again in the loop. So the past is not only in progress, it is an ongoing process. Um, so this war is something very obvious and repeated uh, several times. It is intensely and extensively documented war. Um, so we have governmental institutions, NGO, artists, researchers in Ukraine internationally coming. So they're not fixed to place. Um, and uh, this actually defines the future history and memory and heritage of this war. We don't know what it will be, but it's probably a big um, element in what it's shaping. And, and being about that, I was thinking that as historians, uh, through what we do in highlighting how it's important to accommodate very diverse, different, marginal, and even dissonant experiences, because it will be crucial for society on a long path of recovery and healing. And maybe we do not have to share all these dissonance and different immediately, because we are really in a very fragile moment now. So it's a question of time, it's a question of moment, but it's also a possibility of a framework which will future in the future will allow for more experiences to be included and articulated. And it's not only about history as a sake of history, this is also resonates with what was discussed in the morning with the trauma panel. So what experiences we can articulate are allowed, are expected. So, so we are Looking for expanded and expanding probably notions and boundaries of what is archive, what is research, what is academic, what is public. Um, maybe a possibility of more horizontal and community based formats of public history of commemoration. Uh, something to keep in mind. And many bridges are to be built across disciplines again and again about history and psychology or psychoanalysis and art and urban planning and across geographies. Because you know, war is not contained to national borders. I think I mean we, we, we talk about millions of people displaced, um, and uh, the experience of one trauma reflects again how we see and whom we see in telling the history of the past wars. So it basically will be, I think, it's one of the something to note how we are in constant circulation in a way of moving back and forward and. Uh, 
So thinking about one of the themes I think worth exploring is rethinking previous reconstructions and pre-wars. There's a lot to do. So we're discussing destruction and reconstruction from elsewhere, from Rotterdam to Warsaw, from Sarajevo to Aleppo, and this is really important. But at the same time, it also makes us, can make us think how Ukraine sits on multiple legacies touching several national stories of reconstruction, at least for the 20th century. And they are in the boxes of national, different national histories. And I think that could be a moment that we can reach out to that boxes. Don't, don't take it out away, but rather connect. I think in a, so post World War One, it's not only about uh, it's about Kharkiv and Soviet Ukraine as a reconstruction, but it's also it's about Lviv and post um, uh, post Imperial Polish Second Polish Republic. It's about Czechoslovakia. It's about Romania. It's about Chernivtsi, and it's about Uzhgorod. Then um, there is a big known theme of post-World War II reconstruction. In a way, we are lacking more case studies, which probably are partly there as a part of local history, case by case cities, and the question how to up, how plug them in into conversation, not only in terms of usable past, to the past that we can refer to, but also of more, um, more inclusive academia research and uh, communication because many of such case studies are written in Ukrainian and many would be probably written more. Uh, and we do have to relate to what this destruction, how you, you know, work with displaced communities, the border change, you know, and more recently to recent like post Chernobyl, which is blended in um, into late Soviet and early independence Ukraine and lives with us until now and post 2014 reconstruction, which was happening in Mariupol, which was happening in many of the cities. So, so basically what I'm trying to say here at this point that it's actually how to see because some of the stories we see, some we know, but we do not connect to them and some we don't really notice so how seeing and working critically through this multiple post-war stories as a part of history, but also probably as a heritage as thinking about intangible and tangible, uh, is, uh, you know, builds a possibility for more complex and locally embedded knowledge and new theories, and maybe uh, gaining some agency and subjectivity in the conversation with other cases, with other geographies and internationally. Uh, the war brings rethinking and revisiting words and concepts, and even creating the new ones, and we know that from the previous experiences. So I'm, I pick up word diaspora, um, seeing how many people who are not ethnically Ukrainians, but do trace their family histories to Ukraine, cities now in Ukraine, cities, towns and villages often destroyed in World War II, in the Holocaust, in the post, uh, during the war and of war, post-war displacement. I'm speaking about Polish community. So we do have to ask, you know, is diaspora uh, something that we can conceptualize these connections as a diaspora expanded concept or we need a new word. So, or this is um, the, I have one minute, but you know, uh, it's for the commission that I was correcting. <laughs> um, Michal said two last points um, is about how massive destruction of built environment opens new ways in seeing the value in it and beyond it. So we do see something that resonates with the discussion on heritage yesterday, and we actually see how it is in the frontline areas that industrial, largely Soviet, but also late imperial built environments is destroyed together with family albums, stories about life, you know, and the whole displacement. And I think that this is also together with the decommunization and the Russification, we do have this expression in changing street names and initiative of removing monuments. Um, and I think that you know, in all of that, we focus a lot on discourse, on the content. It's good to look at the people who are on the process, or the people who are involved. And so keeping you know, in mind that there are the recommendations coming from experts, which is a position of power, 
or government, which is another position of power, uh, it is kind of good to share that authority because when it's shared, it's empowering authority. And when it's not shared, it's oppressing. So building trust, another word that we use today uh, a lot in the morning is about seeing actors, special on the ground, accepting diversity of responses and ideas and attitudes and take into, a more, into account very emotional load and how that is possible in this. And finally, decolonization, which is, and I want to just two things to mention here, um, and hopefully they'll unwrap more in discussion. So I think it is the importance of applying and adjusting the tools. We can discuss that, or toolbox, uh, or frames to ourselves. You know, like really, it is difficult. It's hard intellectual work and emotional work, even in peacetime, not speaking about wartime, but still keep it in mind, you know, in Ukraine, you know, when we are changing names of streets after under the colonizing agenda, we tend to reiterate rather than amend past injustices, you know, failing to give space to underrepresented voices, women, people of different social and ethnic background, not connected with politics, not necessarily in high culture. So, you know, how to challenge the canon here. Beyond Ukraine, it's also, you know, not an overestimation to say that the war is global. Um, so we actually, it's worth examining critically how our paths of knowledge production and cultural exchange operate disproportionately in relation to the West, also a theme that has been picked up in other panels. And how we can, you know, and how we are keeping reiterating rather than challenging these geographies of power. And one of the questions for us as historians could be, you know, how can we look beyond Western Europe, North America, and um, explore and historicize connections uh, between Ukraine and more generally Eastern Europe and countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America with all complexity, with all ambivalence, uh, and with all complicity that we also have in something, some things that could be on our agenda as we uh, move, as least we are thinking about past um, for future in the progress. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophia. That was uh, excellent and very uh, generative and so many questions posed, which uh, I'm sure we will pick up on. Uh, our next speaker in the order um, the, uh, of the of the conference website is Mayhill Fowler. Uh, so Mayhill, uh, Dr. Mayhill Fowler is associate professor in the Department of History at Stetson University, and her full bio has just been posted in the chat. So Mayhill, over to you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Michal. Thank you so much, Sophia, for the invitation and for the organizers of this incredible event. Um, it's a real privilege to be a part of it. So I want to make um, two points, sort of to put two points on the table for our discussion, and both have to do with a switch that I've been observing in myself and in some colleagues since February between um, being a teacher and a scholar of the Soviet and being a teacher and a scholar of Ukraine, not Ukraine as a nation state, but as a region, an arena, a laboratory that shapes and is shaped by larger structures. And um, I wanna start by talking about teaching. Um, one of the great aspects of this symposium is the number of practitioners, right? People engaging in practice who are presenting. And my practice is teaching, right? That's what I do every day. And I wanna state my positionality, which is that I was hired 10 years ago to teach Russian and Eastern European history in a small non-elite school in central Florida. And this positionality is really important. It means that for most of my students, this will be their only contact, not only with history, but also with the region. So I think really carefully about what I want them to take away, especially as they go out and vote. And we're talking here about um, decentering, and that's all very interesting, but I think I'm most interested in the practices and the processes involved in doing that. So less the theory, more the practices. And right now, I'm really focused on sources and on primary sources in English that students can read um, by engaging with voices from not the center, um, not Moscow, not the RSFSR, um, not, not Russian language. They automatically get a more 
varied and nuanced view of the story. And I wanna say that institutions are working on this translation work. There is a new website, Ukrainica, that the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute um, just launched just recently. Um, the Center for Urban History is actually doing a huge um, educational project on kind of collating, translating, annotating um, a lot of primary sources for educators. But this work is really, really important. Um, for example, there's a really great um, collection called Soviet Culture and Power, which is a, a collection of primary sources on the arts that Katarina Clark and Eugenie Dobrenko um, published with Yale University Press. It's great. It is great for student research papers at the undergraduate level, but they're all about the center. They're all about Moscow Art Theater, Stanislavski, Meyerhold, Bulgakov. And so students can write papers on these topics. I can tell them about Les Kurbas, Mikola Kulish, different stories, the stories I wrote about in my book, but they, the students themselves, aren't engaging in that research and that deep engagement with those stories. So we really need more primary sources. Um, and I'll say just this week, I had a student come up to me. She wants to write her research paper in my class on 19th century Ukrainian language theater, which is a dream come true. But I realized there's literally no sources in English. There are no sources in English for her to work with. Right. So if we want to decenter the story, we need to give students the tools to do that. I also want to bring up this challenge of Soviet history when students bring certain politics to class. Like we're telling these stories in a place and in a very specific place. And for a lot of my students, they don't understand socialism. And there's sort of this like this knot of socialism, communism. Hitler, Putin, Stalin, somehow it's one person, um, and kind of leftist politics, and it's all together in one knot. And it's not their fault. It's my job to untie that knot. It's my job to understand, to disentangle for them policies of the welfare state with the worst practices of the Soviet regime. Um, but it can be really complicated. And I, I worry that um, I taught Soviet history in spring 2022, and I think I only re reified and confirmed all of their stereotypes and assumptions about not only Stalin and the Soviet Union, but leftist politics in general. The politics of the classroom are real and really important. And I think um, because these are general education courses, I've been using the Soviet Union, the history of the USSR, as a way to, as a way for my students to question their assumptions, to like think differently about the world in which they grew up and their worldview. And to think critically about the United States, actually, well, how we deal with our relationships with the state, our obligations to the state and the state's obligation to us, and uh, to think about how we do medicine in this country, how we do education, how we do taxes. And so the USSR has been a way to sort of challenge them in that way. And so I'm, I'm working now on how to keep that challenge, that educational goal, but also deal with the reality of the violence and the oppression and the disregard for individual life that we see in the Soviet Union. So um, those politics of the classroom I'd like to put out on the table. Second big um, point to put out is research and how I'm seeing the past differently. My frames are shifting, partially because of emotion and the emotional experience of watching um, people I love, many of whom are in this Zoom room, um, experience the war. And I've always been interested in lives, but I those lives for me as a researcher fell into categories into which I'd been trained. I was trained as a Soviet historian. I told Soviet lives. I used Soviet categories. And now I feel more a scholar of Ukraine as a place. And I'll just give a very a quick example. I'm writing a book on women in Soviet Ukrainian theater. It's called Comrade Actress, Soviet Ukrainian Women on the Stage and Behind the Scenes, which is a great title, but I'll probably have to change it. Um, because it's really become less about Soviet women. It's really less about the Soviet and more about women in this region, this place, um, as Sophia has just touched on in her comments, that is a place of multiple occupations, right? People lived through occupations in World War I and World War II. It is a place of um, state collapse. It is a place of state building. It is a place of multiple wars, right? Um, and, and multiple traumas and I'm realizing that for me now, the line between say those, those women who were evacuated to Central Asia with the Soviets in World War II, and those who ended up staying under Nazi occupation and then in American DP camps is really fluid. The line is blurred. 
contingency is everywhere. And that contingency and those experiences and that trauma shape this place, Ukraine. And so this place can help us understand these larger themes, art and trauma, gender and theater, rebuilding. The previous panel actually was just a primary source on Ukraine, right? And the ways that this experience, even beyond sort of the borders, right, helps us understand um, this place and helps us understand the role of art in war. So Ukraine for me was a case study, it used to be a case study on the Soviet arts landscape. I told stories of Soviet lives, but I'm interested in switching that around and looking at the full stories of people who lived here, who may have had a Soviet period in their lives, but also generally had other influences, um, or at least that Soviet unfolded differently in this place than elsewhere. I'm interested in the process and the practices of how we tell these stories in the classroom, in our books, and how we tell these stories when our frames and our categories are shifting. And I'll just end with this final um, thought that I'd love for us to discuss, which is, um, this very disorienting experience of um, uh, making statements, teaching in class, writing an article, writing a book, when the frames are shifting and when the analytic categories are shifting um, in this great, this great sort of moment of um, you know, epistemological instability. And we're in the middle of it and we don't know where it's gonna go. And so I think acknowledging that our frames are shifting and the landscape is shifting and our analytic categories are shifting is really important. And I'd love to discuss what we do with that. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mayhill, for that. Yeah, um, plea for and set of strategies for uh, well-sourced and, and well-resourced uh, disentangling um, decolonization um etc um so that was that was great and we move now on to kimberly st julian varnan um who is a phd student in history at the university of pennsylvania and her work both scholarly and um uh, public media uh writing uh examines how the presence of people of color shaped ideas and understandings of race ethnicity and nationality policy in the soviet union East Germany, but also very much in contemporary Ukraine and Russia. And if you do one thing today after this conference, and if for some reason you don't yet follow Kimberly on Twitter, then rectify that uh, immediately. Um, it's really, it's really, uh, yeah, one of the best resources for 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 understanding what's going on today and and then. So thanks, Kimberly. Over to you. Thank you, um, and thank you everyone for being here and for joining us today across the world. I, I love. Zoom world when we can all come together and connect. Um, so my positionality is, is very interesting. Um, I've been obsessed with the Soviet Union since I was a small child. I wrote my first book report on Stalin and how terrible a man he was in fifth grade. So I think, you know, I've been set up pretty well <laughs> for the current moment. But I think I come to this both as being trained as a Soviet historian and what that means. And what I did in my master's work, I did the, uh, my master's thesis on the Holodomor, particularly the subjectivity of people who experienced and survived the Holodomor. And, and what I found early on was I would get angry that so much of our narratives of, of Soviet history were defined by the state, by state archival documents written by people who were carrying out a veritable genocide against Ukrainian peasants. And so for my early work, my goal, and it still is my goal, is to force us to understand Ukraine as a part of the Soviet Union. There is no Soviet Union without Ukraine. There's no Soviet history without Ukrainian history. And so these are things that I, I join together in my work and in my current academic research in terms of the experiences of Africans and African-Americans and Afro-Slavs and Afro-Germans. Um, some of the most interesting things I've found are the interactions between Afro-Americans and Africans in, you know, Soviet Russia. I just tweeted about how annoyed I am that Americanists constantly call the entire Soviet Union Russia. Um, and, and Soviet Ukraine and the intricacies of those experiences. And my own experiences in Ukraine, there's a reason why I did my initial research in Ukraine and not Russia, because at that point, Ukraine was safer for me as a woman of color than Russia was. And so, 
unfortunately, the war has brought to bear all of these connections between my personal experience and, and my research in Ukraine and in Russia. And I see myself as a historian of the Soviet Union, Russia, and Ukraine. Um, and so thinking about decolonization, and I just wrote a piece about how Ukraine as a unique position as a European country, but also a colonized European country, can make inroads and connections with um, you know, leaders of the African Union, but also African people, because Russia has commodified and laundered its reputation on the African continent. And so I think that some of the greater things we can see in terms of the usability of the past, but also this push towards decolonization, not only in Ukraine, but in how we look at Ukraine as historians, I think we can draw from the work of historians of Africa and of Southeast Asia and of these countries that have gone through decolonization to help us inform how we approach Ukraine. And while I think Ukraine has a story that will definitely ring in the ears of people who have experienced decolonization, Ukraine and many of the former Soviet states, including you know, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Georgia, Poland, can learn from the experience of the global South who've gone through this process. So this allows us to have a transnational and more international lens on our work, but also I think it magnifies the ways in which Russia historically, and both in terms of historical work, but in public understanding of Russian history, has been allowed to skate by on this idea that it was never an imperial state, on the idea that the Soviet Union was not in fact an internal colonizing state. And I think through our work, both publicly and also academically, we can address some of these issues. And that's what I've tried to do on Twitter. Literally, I was just a grad student tweeting about having a caffeine addiction. Um, and then as the tension started to build, I started tweeting about Ukrainian history because so few people knew about it. I was correcting people saying, don't say the Ukraine. There's a reason why we no longer say that and this is why. And so when the war started and I, I saw these narratives of this is somehow an American colonial war because people did not either know about the history of Russia as a colonizing power or were ignoring it. I was like, no, this is not allowable. And this is why when we think about this war, that this is an existential war for Ukraine, not only physical existence, but this is about the ability of Russia to destroy Ukrainian history and culture. When they bomb archives, that is a very clear signal that they are destroying the historical memory of this country that has struggled against Russian oppression for so long. And as we think about how do we decenter stories of empire, and I, as a graduate student, I'm thinking about my own teaching. I took the, you know, my seminars of the history of the Russian empire, the history of the Soviet Union, but they center Russia. And I think they're really easy ways for us to do this. If you're teaching a course on the, the Russian empire, Okay, start with Catherine the Great, but let's talk about how Russia expanded south, you know, southward, south westward into Ukraine. What did it mean for the Cossacks to have the frontier closed that way? What, the Pale of Settlement cannot exist without colonial expansion and repression. So these are really easy ways for us just to include something that is not great man or great woman history in the way we teach the history of the Russian Empire. The Soviet Union existed before and existed after Joseph Stalin. What does that mean? What does it mean if Soviet leaders like Nikita Khrushchev, if they were forged in the fire of the Holodomor and taking grain from Ukrainian peasants? These all have long-term meanings that we just aren't examining um, because we center so much the Kremlin. And I think that Mayhill made a great argument about our frames are shifting. And I find myself in this position thinking about ethics in our research. Is it, I, it is not only is it possible to do dissertation research in Russia and Ukraine, is it ethical to do dissertation research in Ukraine and Russia right now? Not only because doing dissertation research in Russia means money going to the war machine that's committing a genocide, but on the flip side, doing research in Ukraine right now means taking away electricity, water, and gas from people who do not have the bandwidth to give those things to academics, particularly American academics like me. So these are all things that I think about as I go through this process of, of earning my doctorate, but also as I try to engage the public and, and teach them about Ukraine, but also teach them about the greater connections between Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, all of these former colonial holdings of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union 
because I think as we turn the tables and we start pressuring people, even people who are not experts in our region, to stop being intellectually lazy and sloppy when they engage with our region, I think it helps us, but most importantly, it helps Ukraine because Ukraine will survive this war, but it will take a global community to foster Ukrainian strength again. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly, for that yeah, brilliant presentation and very instructive and motivational too. And in a way, what Mayhill argued that we need the sources and we need the resources, but we don't we do need to strive for those, but we don't need to wait for everything to be translated and for everything to be found in the archives. We can start now. And it really shouldn't be that hard, as you as you have very, very compellingly argued, I think. So um anyway, we move on to the final speaker on this on this roundtable, uh, Yulia Yurchuk, uh, who is a historian of Ukraine and Eastern Europe in the uh, 20th century, and uh, currently teaches at Sudeten University in uh, Sweden. So, uh, Yulia, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you, Michal, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, panel and uh, to the conference. It's uh, Shia. Uh, pleasure to be with you and uh, just listening to the speakers it's uh, already uh, therapeutic uh, for me so it's really very nice to be with you and it's great that I'm speaking after Mayhill and uh, Kimberly because they already took uh, up a lot of uh, things um, which I was thinking about so it was it will be kind of uh, uh, wrapping up and maybe repeating but also I do agree that we are positioned in a very um, concrete uh, context and and uh, my context is um, a bit different. It's not uh, the US and uh, I'm uh, in Sweden. I live and uh, teach here for many years. And um, uh, here in Sweden, there is certain fascination of uh, all things Soviet and the Soviet Union. So my uh, students, they kind of think that they know what uh, uh, socialism is and uh, they kind of know what the Soviet Union is and uh, what I'm uh, maybe doing is uh, uh, they mystifying their understanding of the Soviet Union and it's uh, exactly as Kimberly said that uh, it's um, a lot about uh, the Soviet Union beyond Stalinism and what was happening not only during the Stalinism because this kind of history of Stalinism they do know these students but uh, uh, Everything else, it's still um, very much um, not known. And uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a very pragmatic understanding of uh, Russia being uh, um, a threat to to the Baltics, to Sweden, and it's a very close threat. So it's kind of very. Um, a, a particular situation where there is this kind of socialist the communist past but it's also the Ru russia which is close and it's always this threat of russia which is uh, very present in sweden and um, speaking about uh, all this uh, dem demystification as i see it, uh, it it's exactly as michael said it's like um, uh, taking uh, this soviet union from the pedestal and in my case it's very kind of uh, uh, fascinating uh, f fascination uh, that people have about the soviet or like russian avant-garde uh, as we were speaking just uh, uh, in last um, panel and uh, uh, for instance, I'm never uh, using the term like Russian revolution because then what kind of like which revolution we are speaking and this is also something that uh, makes the story more complex and um, uh, also uh, I'm a historian of, of uh, Ukraine and uh, I also think how we uh, historians can tell a more complex history of Ukraine as well. So uh, speaking about this, uh, the Sovietization process, like the communization and uh, the uh, colonization now. So how we make this story more uh, complicated. And uh, I also think about archives and uh, my main um, concern now is uh, the destruction of our archives and how we will write the history. And also as Kimberly says, uh, when it, will it be possible to use Russian archives, how to write history of the Soviet Union or the Soviet period without having uh, this archive. So this is also something that I constantly think about. And uh, just, um, uh, I want to, um, 
um, close uh, my um, short uh, notice uh, by speaking a bit about um, this the de um, decolonization because I was uh, using decolonization approach uh, for many years and uh, I remember when I started um, uh, with the decolonization very often when I said that I use uh, post-colonial theories uh, approach in Ukraine uh, people were um, uh, offended um, people were saying that we are not a colony and uh, this is like totally unacceptable and now it's kind of a common place to speak about uh, the uh, decolonization so this is also something what is interesting for me as a scholar and I myself I'm becoming more and more careful by uh, with uh, this um, using the concept decolonization because I see that our uh, epistemologists like um, uh, what we read in uh, post-colonial theory decolonial theories it's very much um, uh, grounded on other contexts which are not always um, may be applicable to Ukraine. So we maybe need to redefine what, what um, decolonization is in the uh, Ukrainian context, uh, mainly. Um, so here I, I can stop and maybe we can speak about it uh, more during our discussion. Thank you, Yulia. Yeah, that's great and really well-timed presentation, but also so clearly stated and powerfully stated in this um, I also um, exist in this kind of like seesaw, like exhausting um, pendulum of enthusiasm for the idea of decolonizing and a decolonial approach applied to places in the post-Soviet world and the post-socialist world and hesitation. And I can't get out of that. I can't stop this pendulum. I never know which direction to swing in because for a long time, I too was reluctant to can simply compare as a Polish person to compare the experiences of, say, Polish people vis-a-vis -vis the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union and people in uh, uh, decolonial, post-colonial contexts in Africa or Asia or, or Latin America. Uh, but on the other hand, especially since the 24th of February, the decolonial lens has been so powerful and I think empowering to many uh, Ukrainian colleagues and friends uh, and scholars and artists and has allowed them to um, to really comprehend uh, uh, levels of dependency, historical processes, contemporary processes, uh, and to appreciate and to comment upon them. And also for like Russian people are so resistant, viscerally resistant to the word colonialism being applied either to the Russian or the Soviet experience. Uh, and the kind of uh, explosion of interest in the in the idea of the of Russian imperialism among um, indigenous uh, nationalities, um, minority communities in Russia uh, since the twenty fourth of February is 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 fascinating to watch. So surely there is something quite powerful about this a renewed power to this term. Um, but I yeah I wonder if 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 uh, if any of you have. Maybe we've talked about this enough, but maybe there's something more to say about whether whether this idea needs to be simply applied, whether it needs to be renamed, nuanced. Um, what to what what to do with the with the decolonial, uh, Kimberly? So this has been an interesting question I've been grappling with, and like even I mean early on, like 2013, 2014, I remember hearing about Ukraine and the colonial. I, you know, idea and people were very hesitant, like we, you know, Ukraine was a colony. Central Asia can be talking about decolonization when Ukraine and Poland can be talking about it. And so I think we have to interrogate why, what is the discomfort with that? Why can Central Asia, why can Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan be colonized, but Ukraine and Poland can't? And I think it pushes against these ideas of what Europeanness is. And so if you are European, how could you be a colony? And these are ideas and attitudes that have been used against allowing or seeing Poland and Ukraine and, you know, Hungary as European, right? So I think if we push ourselves to think about decolonization as something that can happen to people who are traditionally colonized, it only strengthens our resolve to think critically about Russian history in ways we haven't done before. 
Um, I, I think that, you know, the decolonial and as a, as, as a scholar of Soviet and like the period which is after the war, um, I could say that, you know, probably the, in the context of using it, it's also, it's also about time. And I think that, you know, then uh, when we use it and uh, the past of Ukrainian discourse, which worked very openly with the notion that uh, it's a colonial relations, yeah, so this is, and then it was also you know, counter argued not only by people who were researching and pointing out how much people from Ukraine and Ukrainians were co creators and contributors. And we are, in, we are implicitly living off a lot, you know, from housing to uh, education, you know, and all of that. It's a question of owning. And then that this is also different parts of, you know, different stories, family stories. And so the more we go from this experience, the more they will be mixed because, you know, we intermarry, we get families and this, uh, the boundaries will blur. And I think that this is also um, rather reflecting the, a, little, a lot of ambivalences because on one hand, you do have uh, relations which could or experiences that can be highlighted using that frame and others you are on the other side um, of the uh, of the so it's been and colonized and colonizing but i think that what really is helping and i think i'm not sure if it will come up with new theory or they will come up with new words like literally new word but definitely proliferation of usage of this word probably because you know the hearing that you know it's not a it's not only a word that researchers are using or intellectuals are using, it's, a, it's, it's on the streets, you know, it's bureaucrats are using, you know, it just is a word which is right now, I think, is caught to reflect something we are going through. Um, and uh, that actually up in the, um, as we will see whether it will be, you know, it will get new meaning inside of that and it will be, uh, both more aware of the experiences we are living through and also maybe learning about other usages of this and what are the connotations so the genealogy of this concept. And I think therefore it is also important of this, what I was and what Kimberly, you were saying, it's about, you know, having like learning about post-colonial and decolonization, not through the uh, relations only with the uh, global West, but also speaking directly to people and colleagues and establishing. And it's hard to establish these networks, to be honest, because, you know, um, resources and funding flow in a different relation. And then, you know, if you would imagine to having cooperation uh, between Ukraine and Ghana, how we are going to, who's going to fund that? <laughs> that's like you know who's going to fund uh you know visa costs um uh or not visa costs travel costs. i mean like so this is something to ask maybe it's not about bilateral maybe it's actually we have to share down the networks and like kind of you know build them in a way which is more of consortium but not eu consortium style but kind of you know really expanding the partnership idea, and then and 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 then uh, this might enable us, um, you know, to tune and to learn and to and, and to come up with uh, with uh, better tools to understand where we are. Um, Mehul and Julia, you both yeah. put your hands up at the same time. I think Mehul was a split second before. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that these are all really great comments. I would I would agree with both of you. And I would say to, to Mikhail's comment, this has been a really generative discussion. Uh, do you know what I mean? Like, however much we may kind of disagree with and be uncomfortable with um, this concept of decolonization and what exactly we mean by it. And um, it has been really generative, right? Um, and, and really productive, not only in my thinking, but in the thinking that I see on all the Zoom calls and webinars that I go to. And I think what that means is that it's raising really important questions. And um, questions that, you know, why didn't we ask these questions 10 years ago? But we didn't, but we're asking them now. And I, I would agree with something, um, Kimberly, you were saying of like, you know, I've been kind of thinking about this for quite some time. And 
And I would agree with you, right? And and I was kind of like generally like tweaking with my syllabus a little bit, you know, without sending it to the curriculum committee and kind of, you know, thinking about some ideas. And now everybody's having these discussions. And I think that's really good. And I think, um, I think the challenge is all of our, a lot of our literature on colonialism and therefore decolonization does come from say the British and the French empire, right? It comes from over there. And so when I was being trained and in my early thinking on this, I really didn't think of Ukraine as a colony because I was using this other, you know, it has to be an overseas empire and it has to have these certain elements of race and, you know, it has to fit in this certain paradigm. Um, and I think, um, What's interesting for me is I've started teaching in the last couple of years an Eastern Europe survey. So I've been teaching Russian Empire and Soviet century. Now I'm teaching, teaching Eastern Europe. And that has really helped me see the ways that um, post-colonial literature and these concepts of the colony can be really useful in Ukraine. Because when you teach Eastern Europe, you constantly see Russia um, uh, engaging violently and in oppressive ways with these with, with Eastern Europe. And yes, Eastern Europeans do become involved, right? We do see the Cossacks becoming involved. We do see the Poles, we do see sort of involvement and co-creation of these structures, but we also see very much a lot of these kind of colonial practices. And so for me, like teaching Eastern Europe has helped me see the Russian empire and the Soviet Union in a, in a decolonial way. I would also wanna, I, re, I wanna make a reference to um, Oleksandr Polyanchev, who just finished his, PhD at the European University Institute in Florence. He's also on Twitter. So when you follow Kimberly on Twitter, also follow Oleksandr Polyancha um, because he's doing a lot of this sort of myth debunking about the Russian empire, right? That they were totally involved in colonialism. They really wanted to be in the African subcontinent. They were trying really hard to be there, right? They were obsessed with these Western empires. And, and that kind of work I think comes from this moment, right? And, and is really, refreshing and really forcing us to rethink a lot of things that, you know, maybe we were sort of thinking about on the back burner, but now we really have to think about them. So I think that these, um, th this rethinking and this, the generative nature of, of, um, of these conversations is, is really important. And I think just picking up on Sophia's point, thinking about knowledge structures and like how cooperations exist in their geography and how they create knowledge is, is also really important. Fantastic. Uh, Julia, you had a response as well. Uh, yes, I just wanted to add that um, for me, this um, kind of communications, uh, conversations we have about um, uh, decolonization, it's a kind of a symptom that some kind of post uh, has ended. Uh, really, we see that this post-Soviet has ended. Uh, there is no like post-Soviet Ukraine. It's uh, kind of, uh, we use this post-Soviet to uh, the region. And now we see that Ukraine is not uh, a part of this region. It's not uh, the same as uh, Belarus. It's not the same. So we had like Baltic states, which uh, who were drifting from this post-Soviet. And now Ukraine, we cannot say that this is a post-Soviet country anymore. And uh, for me, uh, wh what uh, I was also thinking that, um, like uh, in my last paper, I was uh, um, I was using the term the. Um, uh, canonization just to avoid the, the, uh, all others do so I used the decanonization because this is also about this mm -hmm. like um, distancing from the canon just drifting from this canon and also uh, what is uh, for me why I was questioning this de uh, decolonization just because of the uh, um, writers we use when we are speaking about uh, decolonization and uh, for me Ukraine is just in a different moment so when we uh, when just uh, we are speaking about like um, Homi Baba or um, Salmat uh, Rajdi, we speak about them as uh, post-colonial writers. But uh, what they uh, as Rajdi, for instance, uses this uh, term uh, a fork tongue and uh, or Baba the third space of enunciation, and they never really kind of. Um, uh, 
uh, distance from the language, right? They they use the language of the colonizer. And mm -hmm. in Ukraine, it's uh, quite a different uh, vector, uh, which is um, Ukraine taking. And that is why it's very difficult to use the terms produced by these uh, epistemologists. But on the other hand, of course, the process itself, like uh, being colony, being controlled, and being a part of colonization itself, it's very much like colonial experience. That is why I see kind of differences. And that is why it's very difficult to use the instruments which are already there in all these post-colonial theories, which are not really applicable in this particular situation. And one last comment is about this kind of epistemologies which were produced in the West by all these um, uh, post-colonial writers who were working with the Western um, intellectuals who also supported them and who uh, kind of had this self-critique and uh, criticized uh, Eurocentrism and everything. And we don't have it in uh, intellectual discussions in Russia. I have never seen it uh, uh, coming from some uh, intellectual from Russia. Like, let's let's uh, criticize ourselves. Let's uh, uh, let's fight for Ukrainian uh, decolonization and for Ukrainian victory at the end. So this is only my uh, my take on these differences. So. Yeah, and I just that's brilliant, Julia. And I suppose one other, just to add another fork to to the post-colonial decolonial tongue. Uh, I think my one of my earlier hesitations to uh, post-colonial um, discourses with uh, with regard to Poland is that on the on the on the pol on the right of the Polish historical spectrum, there is an enthusiasm for engaging with, or there was sort of ten years ago or so. There was this kind of spurt of enthusiasm for engaging with Edward Said and Homi Baba and Spivak, and in order to theorize Polish subjugation to Polish as a as a theory uh, uh, towards a theory of Polish victimhood, effectively. And I think the same can be the same thing happens in Russia. And obviously, people like Dugin, unfortunately, not to overstate, not to even mention his name, but in, and 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 the and the multiple mini Dugins that haunt and populate uh, Russian academia and the art world uh, in, engage with post-colonial theory and m try to make these absolutely banal and, and false uh, alliances between Eurasianism and, and decolonial or post-colonial thought. So there, there, yeah, there are there are many there are many curious and, and, and mutated uh, forks that these tongues can can potentially take, and that one has to be cautious of. Or perhaps one can just simply disregard them. So I just ignore what I just said. Um, Marta has a has a comment or question. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, I actually want to speak to. Kimberly is really engaging contribution um, on the subject of, you know, we're speaking about decentering and decolonization, and we're talking about, you know, sort of denying so everything Soviet, and yet there's an incredibly rich history to be gained from how Soviet Ukraine actually operated, and and um, and there is something very interesting that Kimberly pointed out about Soviet internationalism and how that took hold or unfolded in Ukraine, like the Ukrainian SSR. Um, and I think that that, you know, that relationship was a very strong one, Soviet internationalism with respect to Ukraine and what was called the third world then and now called the, the global South. Um, it was something that I don't, I mean, this is, I'm really curious to learn more about it. It's something that artists, for example, or two artists from Kiev in early 2000s that looked to the Dobzhenko Film Archive and looked at the films that led to the feature films and they were newsreels. And those newsreels and those fragments showed the leaders of African nations coming to Ukraine and being greeted with bread and salt and having an, a very important relationship between Patrice Lumba and the Congo. And, um, and so 
this is something that perhaps is not in the, as you're saying, the state archives, but they they certainly are in film archives. Um, things that, and it was amazing that these these uh, artists uh, had access to this where they wouldn't have it from Moss Films, for example, because of the they, they were readily available. And I I also speak to this because now we're facing, you know, it was also an interesting place where in the uh, the Pan-African uh, uh, conferences, there was a possibility for an alignment with a non-Western socialism, you know, and, and also, for example, we think even how uh, uh, problematic Olaf Palma's relationship was to the United States with his relationship with the ANC. So I'm just thinking that these are important histories because now we're dealing with a geopolitical situation where the global south is really evading, you know, or really being ambivalent about the position in Ukraine. And so I think this is a very generative discussion that's not only about revisiting history, but could actually be generated, generative in helping these kinds of dialogues to open up. And so I wondered. Kimberly, if you could just speak a bit more to this or whether deny it, or I don't, I don't know what, because it's, it's a bit of a conjecture on my part, so. Sure, and it's something I've been thinking about recently, and I think the war kind of sparked this, this line of thought in me because I was so surprised by how so many people from the global South were, were reacting to the scenes of the latest Russian invasion. And immediately I was like, how can you not understand what this is? This is, <laughs> this is a neo-colonial war. But I think it's because so often in the historiography, but also in popular understandings of, of Soviet internationalism, that is read as Russian internationalism and Russian engagement with the global South. And that's just fundamentally untrue. As we, uh, I mean, African students, thousands of African students studied across the Ukrainian SSR, Lviv, Kharkiv, Kiev, Odessa, well, all places I was going to be researching in, you know, this summer before the war. And so I think that if we expand our understanding and our teaching of the role of non-Russian Soviet republics and engaging with the global south, it can help forge those bonds. Um, but also, I can I think it also help us kind of work with this idea of of sitting with discomfort within uh, thinking about colonization and decolonization in in places that traditionally we don't have in the literature. I think this is a perfect way for us to say when we think about French colonization, British colonization. Much like when we think about racial politics and racialization, it tends to be America, Great Britain, South Africa, Brazil, they dominate this discussion. But these processes are happening. And just because members of the African diaspora aren't necessarily racialized the same way in the Soviet Union, SAR, in France, or in Britain, it doesn't mean those processes aren't happening. And the Soviet Union and Soviet history, but also Russian history gives us really fascinating ways of expanding modes of understanding blackness beyond the African diaspora. That's hopefully what I what I can do. Thank you, Kimberly. And so Sophia, you've got your hand up. Yeah, so you know, I mean it's very much you know following on what Marta asked and Kimberly. Um, I think it's also important, you know, to um it's I would lead it also to the question of archives, you know, because this is, um, and how you know, the structure of archive dominates part of the narrative that we can create. Um, and it's very true that, you know, we do have lots of histories of these connections, which um, I mean, most of the imagination in Ukraine is about West, you know, like Western Ukraine is looking to West and then West is the very big reference point. And I was really surprised at some, you know, many years ago, like clean how actually many people got this experience, which is not Western, you know, this is in imagining the world. And I think that this is something that I is like kind of 
him like interested cursory and uh, cursorily and uh, asking just family history like you know and it's some that somebody's grandfather was to Africa somebody's was uh, expert here and then yeah of course we do find in archives petitions you know of experts to get a job I came across with architect it also opens the whole a geography of expertise in the sense that you know which cities and region that you know, twinned with rich places in global south providing hospital electricity teaching and i think that this is a, it's on one hand it's a history which is international but it's also very kind of very interesting history which is um about social oops, social and on family level you know and you we actually think what is in family archives, what is in family albums, because people would bring so it's 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 uh, but on the other hand, it also would be um the question how these people were going from Ukraine and how race, how perceptions, TV television, I don't know, how all this um, ambiguity of Eastern European experience in global West. And I think that this is good like to really like reach um, and untangle these layers which uh, um, can help us to, um, to, 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 to amend or to adjust of words we're using the colonial, but also in tools which are there. And um, uh, something that uh, about archive, if I may just uh, raise another issue, which coming slightly from the conversation, is about teaching. And I think that this is, um, and ethics, uh, because there is a big need what teaching in the West needs to get. And this is really big part, but this is also the question what people in Ukraine and need you know, to um, in teaching, you know, and this is how we can imagine that this is and who else in a way. So how we can think about archives not, uh, and research not as extracting thing, which has been. So you do have archives there, you extract knowledge and then you just circulate them there, but actually how can you create more sustainable um, knowledge production and uh, with uh, the perspective of archives in Russia closing, or closed, you know, that I think would be a very good also um, opportunity to ask not only what sources are available where, and what kind of, and this is what Dari and Simbaluk is also, what archive, what is beyond archives and how we reconceptually archives and something that I try very much to have, like how, I mean, who creates archives, where archives, or what we label archive collection. Um, and uh, yeah, so how this could be not only a source extraction, but knowledge production, which is much more um, horizontal and, uh, multi-directional if you want. Sorry, I was struggling to unmute myself. Um, uh, Mayhill, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to make a sort of a quick point on, on this um, sort of to, to echo something Kimberly said and to speak to much this question, which is that Soviet Ukraine tends to fall away right? Soviet history is really Russian history in many senses. And absolutely, right? This history of Soviet internationalism, it's really Russian internationalism. That's how people understand it, right? So this, so these materials on um, the experience of Soviet internationalism in Soviet Ukraine, I guarantee you they're in the archives, right? It's just that no one doing a project on Soviet internationalism has gone to Soviet Ukraine because it doesn't count, because it's not the center, because the story only exists and only is legitimate if it's told from the center, right? And so I think that this is this is sort of what I'm talking about. Like, can we decenter that, right? Can we just focus on Soviet Ukraine as, as, as legit and as a place that's sort of going through this Soviet experience, right? And and take these stories um, seriously. So I wanted to, to really, sort of ex explain some of that, that like, so, you know, you don't study Soviet Ukraine 
we have not been, I have not been trained to study Soviet Ukraine. I've been trained to study the Soviet Union. And I think that that is shifting now, but it's a shift that that is just happening. Um, and I think it's sort of important to, to understand that. Um, and I did want to bring up Daria Tsimbaluk's question. I think that's, it's really important. Like, yes, archives are constructed and they have power and authority. Um, in defense of archives, um, they have a lot there, actually. And, um, you know, one of the main things I would say is that often people who study theater don't go to state archives. And, and one of the things I did in my book was I spent a lot of time in state archives and found, oh, it's so interesting. In the Politburo, they're talking about the arts all the time, right? And so you actually learn a lot about, about the arts um, from, from the state archives. But I think this, then, then one has to ask, what isn't in the archives? And I sort of want to tie this back to today and, and sort of what this conversation is fixing this as a primary source for future historians, which is that... Um, and by work, what is really missing from the archive is the emotional experience. And, um, you know, one finds references among, you know, women in theater to like their kid is left under occupation and they have no idea for three years what's happened to them. Oh my God, right? But no one talks about trauma. No one talks about the emotion of going through occupation and war. Um, and it's the experience of this war since February 24th that has made me realize how much is lacking in the archive, how much is missing. And so I think this question of what sources are being created now, right? And the records and the record keeping and the transcripts and the oral histories, all of that is so important to create the archive to tell the story of this war, um, you know, decades from now, because that material is missing for World War II. And right. it is extraordinary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I can't. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm done. I'm good. It's it's amazing to see that we have had this conversation in some of the pre-calls and some of the other panels. This ex this uh, extremely large amount of documentation of what's happening now, but then yeah. there is also an extremely large amount of documentation in the archives. But we can't go to the bloody archives now. Yeah. Certainly, we can't go to the ones that are in Russia. And ethically, I don't think I totally agree. I mean, perhaps I totally with regard to archive and research in Ukraine, or other or field work in my case in Ukraine, perhaps there is a way of working around some of the ethical limitations as, as long as sufficient resources are brought in, as long as you're, you try as hard as possible to be self sufficient. But with regard to doing ethics in Russia, no, don't even no. think about it. Um, but maybe this is this is also uh, Christina Crawford's question. Um, I, I appreciated Kimberly's question about the ethics of scholarly research in either Russia or Ukraine. Could the panelists take this up? So, so yeah, if there are, do do are there any other views about the ethics of doing research in in Russia or Ukraine beyond my rather like um, concretely articulated position? Like what, how, if, if we were to do, I mean, I presume most of us agree about doing research in Russia, if there's a dissenting voice that would be interesting to hear too. Um, and maybe there are ways of working with whatever critical um, people in Russia uh, somehow as assistants, I don't know, probably not. Uh, but what about doing research in Ukraine, field work or, or archival research? How to do that in a way that's considerate, ethical and contributes to um, to, to Ukrainian interests rather than undermining them. Um, I'm sure we all have thoughts on that, but Yulia's hand has been up too. Oh, I'm so sorry, I completely, yeah, yeah, I've got, uh, and Kimberly's hand is up too. So let's go to Yulia and Kimberly. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I just want to connect uh, this question to uh, the question of Vasil and Daria because they all are um, uh, they are all connected, and it's also about archives and uh, uh, Soviet history, Soviet legacies, and how we write uh, Soviet history. And I think that uh, actually because. Uh, uh, of course, uh, now it's not possible to work in uh, Russian archives. That means that uh, maybe it will be uh, more histories uh, written, there will be more histories written from other archives. So like people working in Tbilisi, in Kyiv, uh, and of course Ukraine will win and it will be possible to work in uh, uh, Ukraine soon. And, uh, um, and thinking about this ethics, I think that, um, um, yeah, now it's not possible uh, to work in Russia, but um, 
uh, we'll, we'll see how um, the future will be. So we'll speak about this reconstruction and um, maybe we will come to some very bright future in the uh, in a couple of years and um, uh, also about this uh, archives and I, I'm a big fan of like material archives and I also think that we can extract a lot of them but uh, also I like um, oral histories and in my own research I used a lot of uh, my own archives which I created uh, with purposes of my uh, own research and questions I had uh, so I, I think they can uh, work together very nicely and speaking about emotions so Mayhill mentioned that if you have oral history you have a lot of emotions and you have this personal level a lot really and uh, Kimberly and Sophia I think one of the key issues with not not even just approaching the ethics of doing archival research is we have to confront that our particularly my field so we have history but it's not just the archive um, and, and state produced documents. And I think one way we could approach doing an ethical form of re particular archival research in Ukraine is to support Ukrainian researchers who are there on the ground doing this work and who and the archivists who have been, you know, unemployed possibly because of this war, but also not just doing that, but lightening their loads. What we can do as American researchers is help digitize a lot of these documents because we have the resources and tools. So God forbid, if, if an archive is destroyed, the history and the stories that those archives you know, hold will not be lost. Um, and I think that's something we could do relatively quickly to help, the, to help Ukrainians who are trying to preserve their history right now. Uh, yeah, it's like digitizing is very much um, on my mind because this is something which is done. You know, archival services of Ukraine is really doing, and I mean, incredible work of digitizing. And while archives are closed, people are working. And I think, you know, the it varies depending on the place, of course. Um, I think it's also something about thinking about collaborative projects, because you know, um, at the center, I think we were able to hold a seminar, history, urban history, or urban seminar in July to speak about project of 19th century quality of urban lives um, by Volodymyr Masinchuk. And that actually it was like kind of one of the first that where we were capable of thinking about something which is not directly the war. Uh, and I think that we, as, as, as it is, um, I mean, gradually, I think it's a possibility also to launch collaborative research projects and thinking creatively about archives, those old <laughs> existing, but also those new. And, you know, from the experience that we have at the center of our, our archival collections is, um, uh, is the, you know, reusing of, our, of reusing of sources, you know, like oral history, part of our oral history archive is what we created, but part is also what researchers gave after the using. So I think this is also, it's about recycling and sharing very much, uh, which is really helpful. Um, and, uh, uh, and then, you know, thinking about teaching Soviet Ukraine in Ukraine. I think this is really hard. And I know this is what also repeatedly is coming into the questions and this is teaching and talking about Soviet period. It is, it takes, I mean, it's complicated as you hear it. Uh, and it's intertwined and it's ambivalent. And sometimes it's very un ambivalent and straightforward um, when we think about violence and repression. And then it's again is, and I think that it just requires attention. It requires time, it requires resources. And I think this is also something that is good to think not only how to teach Eastern Europe and Soviet Union and Imperial Russia, Russian empire um, in, uh, in the West in North America, but also how to teach uh, together with uh, uh, institutions that are in the place you're teaching about. And I think that this is really to have like uh, standing collaborations of researchers who are teaching, like maybe teaching in Ukraine. And I think this is something that probably could be an interesting how you can teach across and not only teaching people from the West in the East, you know, for the short, but vice versa. And we are happening more than that. And it will be also interesting to see how this 
you know, how these programs for displaced scholars, for scholars at risks, would create a different environment. Um, and I would be very much, I mean, I would try to be hopeful on that, but, um, but Soviet, Soviet heritage, Soviet history, I think it is very important to deal with, but, you know, just uh, keep doing, keep doing it, keep asking, keep looking, keep discussing, keep asking questions, but also have a lot of patience um, and like keep a lot, this is a marathon because it is a part of the you know history that explains where we are and who we are. Mm -hmm. And yes. just, that's it. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I think the presence of, of uh, Ukrainian scholars in European universities, especially UK universities, but some US universities too, this large amount of scholars who have come beyond because of circumstances beyond their control. I mean, this will be an, an, an interesting thing to observe in terms of the effects that have that has on scholarship. I also want to say as an anthropologist, as the kind of token anthropologist on this panel, that um, interdisciplinary collaboration in terms of adding um, uh, supplementing uh, written archives with emotional material, whatever, uh, interdisciplinary collaborations as well as comparative collaborations have a long have a lot to do in order to to um, to make up for that. But I just wanted to go to to refer to two things from the chat. There's there's a lot of questions that I'm sorry if I'm if I'm missing um, any. Uh, Dima Suruji, who was um, from the Royal College of Art, who was on yesterday's, made a fantastic contribution to yesterday's displacement and shelter panel, which I urge you to watch on YouTube, uh, points out that with the destruction of Palestinian archives in Israel after the Nakba, a lot of oral history was collected uh, from Lebanon, and that helped start forms, new forms of archiving after generations. So it's really a marathon. It's not just a marathon of an academic year, it's a marathon of generations. Um, and uh, Dima's linked uh, to host and panelist AUB's oral history library, but I'll send it to everyone as well. Um, and there's also a the, the oral history library of the American University in, in Beirut. Uh, and there's also a question from Natalia, who was uh, Center for Urban History in Lviv and Columbia University, who was yesterday at the uh, displacement panel. Natalia, we have a few minutes, so do you want to ask this question yourself? Well, I can do that. <laughs> Great to see all of you. Thank you for a wonderful discussion and the whole marathon on the second day of this uh, conference itself, which I perceive as a uh, very thought-provoking uh, contribution to the discussion about the future of Ukraine um, on different levels. But my question is like uh, between the space of documentation, we are now in this field of overwhelming sources which are created uh, by artists, by scholars, uh, by NGOs, by state institutions. And at the same time, we are challenged by the way how to work with the sources and who will work to the sources. Uh, linking to the discussion about decolonization of knowledge and the way uh, who will come and work and who will have resources to access all of these materials depending on the language, uh, but also like uh, what kind of tools can we apply in order to work with these materials? Who will do that? When? <laughs> Is it appropriate? Is it appropriate now for us to start uh, writing some kind of academic text based on these materials. I have many doubts about that, but maybe you can also address a bit uh, like what kind of ethics should be applied uh, to this type of work. Is it the old ethics of compassion and respect that we uh, used to apply all the time? Or should we assemble something different? Should we assemble another type of sensitivity uh, in order to work with uh, materials collected exactly at the moment of the war and a more politicized ethics perhaps and an ethics less based on insurance considerations oh for sure for sure <laughs> all all the possible consequences of these materials coming into another field beyond academia uh, we might think about different ways of instrumentalization of the knowledge uh, and how it can be reduced uh for different reasons if you can reflect on that. So there's there's three hands up. I don't know which ones are legacy hands and which ones are legacy hands as they are called, or which ones are new hands. Um, who wants to go first, Kimberly? I had a legacy hand. Oh, right. 
<laughs> okay. So Julia or Mehil, I don't know who 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 was up first. Mehil was first. Okay. Okay. Um, so these are just great comments and questions. Um, thank you to Dima for these references. Thank you to all of you for this notion of the marathon. I think that's really, really important. We're talking about generations, right? Um, I wanted to address Christina's, I think, very apt question about ethics, which connects with Natalia's question about ethics. And I think like, the short answer is ethics should be applied, right? And um, uh, there are a lot of historians of Russia who are trying to get back to Russia. And I think that's problematic. I think that while the war is going on, we should not be contributing to their economy and their cultural capital and their educational capital. Um, I think that the, the, the shift that that is forcing is really important, right? Um, I can say my role as an undergraduate institution, um, study abroad, for example, to study Russian now, where do you go? You go to Bishkek, you go to Tbilisi, Yerevan, and Riga. And that's amazing. And those courses, um, I'm citing here the School for Russian and Asian Studies, which runs a lot of these courses, one of the major players in study abroad, they're shifting now to, you're not just studying Russian in Yerevan, you also are taking workshops on Armenian culture and language, right? You have to engage in the local. That wasn't true until now. And so what that means is that for the next generation of, of at least Americans studying Russian, they will automatically have a different lens because they're not in the center. And I think sort of seeing how that's gonna affect a lot of the scholarship that eventually comes out is really important. Um, uh, I think to answer Natalia's question, I would echo Sophia's comment, which is that I think this is a time where we really need to think about collaboration and network building. And I hope that one thing that comes out of not only this conference, this moment today, but also um, all of the programs with um, displaced Ukrainians are future networks and building bridges. And even while the war is going on, um, I taught a course online at um, Ivan Franco University in Lviv last spring. Hopefully I'll teach that again this spring. Um, I want that teaching work to continue. I think we need to build networks even while the war is going on um, with Ukrainian universities, um, with scholars, um, in order to avoid um, kind of resource extraction without resource giving. And, and to be very careful, I think, as, as Natalia says, about um, what scholars do with the material, the primary sources coming out right now, right? It has to be a collaborative process. It has to be based on, on networks and, and kind of new connections. Um, because those ethics are really thorny. And I, and I, you know, I don't, I'm also very aware of um, who has the right to tell stories, right? Like I research theater in Ukraine. I've written a lot on theater in Ukraine. I, I'm not gonna write something right now on what's happening in theater. I don't think I have the right. That's not my story to tell. And I think, I, I think that we need to think about, you know, who, who gets to tell the story, who has a right to tell the story, with what sources are you doing that, and how are you contributing to knowledge production, to future knowledge production, and contributing ultimately to rebuilding Ukraine. This is a seminar on rebuilding Ukraine. So we all have to be a part of that. And what does that mean? We're on the cultural front, we're on the educational front, so it can't just be like writing articles. It has to be literally how are we contributing to rebuilding? And the only way to figure that out is to talk to the people in this Zoom room, right? And talk to our colleagues mm -hmm. and figure out what we're doing. And so I hope that these, these connections and these networks mm -hmm. um, happen. Thank, sounds fantastic. Yeah, and carry on talking for, for generations to come. And we, we have to wrap up, but I wonder if there's final comments from, well, Yulia, sorry, you had your hand up. If you, if you can make, make, make it into a final comment. And if Sophia and Kimberly, if you have any final words as well. 
um, that would be great. But Yulia, you go first. Uh, just a couple of words about this uh, ethics, because uh, this is something uh, which I think a lot, and uh, it's um, one of my biggest concerns, because I see already now who is uh, collecting material, who is working with the uh, displaced people, uh, refugees in Sweden, for instance, or in Germany. Uh, uh, and uh, sometimes I just hope that uh, there are some uh, ethical commissions who do their work, because, uh, I mean, uh, sometimes Sometimes it's really very, very uh, difficult uh, ethical situations, I would say. And um, that's why I totally agree with Mayhill that we need to co-create and we really need to think and uh, reflect what we are doing and, uh, um, and who is really doing this research. Yeah. Thank you, Yulia. Um, Sophia or Kimberly, do you have any closing, closing comments? I just want to echo what May Hill said about the responsibility that we have towards rebuilding Ukraine and supporting Ukrainians as people who use Ukraine to produce knowledge. I think it's completely that's part of our ethics is to help you. Fantastic. Thank you. That's a brilliant spot on which to end this roundtable. We have one minute until, <laughs> until we have a one minute break until the next roundtable, but perhaps we'll finish. We'll start the next one three or four minutes late. So let's start, let's start at five past six, um, five past eight Kiev time. Thank you very much, everyone. Dużo dziękuję.
Hello, everyone. I think we're gonna we're about to start panel number four. Let's just make sure that everyone, all the panelists are here. Hello. Hello. Okay. Okay, so um, welcome to the round table number four. It's titled Art Practice in War thinking about the institution of art and education through international mutualism. And my pleasure to hand over to Marta Kuzma. Again, Dasha, thank you so much. Uh, and I wanted to thank everyone for this contributions throughout the day and yesterday and to my colleagues. And this is the last session of the evening, so please hold on. Um, we, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, this evening's uh, panelists, and this includes uh, Vasil Cherepanin, who is the founder and the director of the Visual Culture Research Center in Kiev, which is a, a platform that was created some years ago, and also the institutional director for the Kiev Biennial, which is uh, a sub-project of the Visual Culture and Research Center in Kiev. Um, also, Ola Zhuk, who is the deputy director for the Mistetsky Arsenal in Kiev, Center for Contemporary Art. And my colleague, Keller Easterling, who is an architect, a writer, and a professor of architecture at the Yale School of Architecture. And also my colleague, Peter Osborne, who's a professor of modern European philosophy and the founder and the director of the Center for Research in Modern European Philosophy at Kingston University here in London. And so welcome. Um, on the heels of our, our just former discussion, uh, this panel is attempting to look at what do we actually do now? And how do we actually support the scholars and the academics within Ukraine? And the topic is around art, institution, and war. Some of the topics that we will discuss is what happens to the, the cultural, academic, and arts institution in the time of war, in the facing the challenges and precarity of war, what happens to the mode of operations? What do we retreat to? Or what do we step up to and generate in this time of something that could be retraction, prote protection, dissolution? And what happens when the majority or a large part of the population actually moves, be that to another area of the country or just over the border in anticipation of eventually returning. So there are great shifts and migrations going on. And what happens when half of the, the country is conscripted into staying in the country for military service and the other half either comes in and out of the country because of a commitment or for other things called human relationships. So the point of this is for us to try to actually think about how to cast a transnational net to think about sustaining the scholars, the academics, the cultural producers within the country. I'd like to start with Vasil's contribution because we have been in many discussions together but I think there was a very important point that Vasil raised and also that has been raised throughout this conference is that the war had not just started on February 24th, that the war had actually started some years before, especially in 2014, as an active participant and organizer of the Maidan uh, occupancy. Vasil was very um, central to this. 
And he made the distinction, I would like him to speak about it, the types of new institutions that arrived out of that revolution, the revolution of dignity, and how that differentiates from the types of institutions that happen after a national invasion of February 24th. Vasil, welcome, and we're very happy that you have been here to join us. Is yeah. Is yeah, thanks so much. <laughs> Hello, Privit. Uh, Privit. Uh, yeah, first of all, I would like to thank uh, also all the partners and uh, organizers of this conference for having this uh, uh, very valuable conversation on the, on the possible futures that we lack so much uh, indeed at the moment. And thank you, Man Marta, for your kind introduction and for hosting this, uh, because basically what you pointed out, I think, is a good uh, starting point uh, uh, to, to the, for this uh, discussion. But basically, I would, as we already agreed among the participants of this panel, we would like to keep this kind of a free flow in conversation rather than a series of presentations. I think it would be... Uh, more helpful also for the others to, to intervene and to, to join the talk, because basically what we are talking about uh, presupposes uh, some kind of unavoidably presupposes a, a collective uh, effort, right? So in this sense, uh, when it comes to institutionality of the cultural field in Ukraine, uh, I think that uh, it's really also, I, would, my, I myself would be more kind of uh, more practical, more pragmatic, because it's about some, some type of mechanisms that should work and uh, which are not working and have been not working for the, um, for the last, actually, not only months, but also years. So just to kick off our discussion, I would like to point out at um, <clears throat> several... Uh, several moments that I think uh, worth mentioning when we discuss uh, the, the, uh, uh, the institutions that do exist in, in Ukraine's cultural field, uh, but also the ones which we actually, which we actually lack. So apart from like the, the Maidan experience itself, right? I will come to this a bit later, but I think in general, when uh, what we are dealing with uh, in terms of institutionality in the in the cultural field in Ukraine uh, at the moment uh, has been caused not exactly by the war itself, but uh, indeed has uh, very deep roots uh, which go basically to the very moment of the Ukraine's independence after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And basically, uh, yeah, if, uh, if we keep this as a really honest conversation, which I think is very much needed today, uh, we, we have to acknowledge that basically a culture as a field, uh, again, in sociological even sense, right, has never been in a, in a really a state, U Ukrainian state focus. So it was rather a minor issue. So, and this also has uh, its consequences in terms of institutional functioning, uh, because basically, especially if you compare the Ukrainian cultural field with, uh, with the ones in, in different EU countries, especially, right? We absolutely clearly see that, uh, um, that Ukrainian cultural field can be called autonomous, right? But its autonomy is based only on the lack of financing from the side of the state or any other um, uh, bodies that uh, be it the municipality or, or on the state level, right? So practically speaking, we have never received any kind of funding from the from the ministry or from the city authorities. It's, it hasn't been even a habit, right? In general, in Ukraine, it only changed a bit pretty recently, right? It, actually, after Maidan. So in this sense, if we speak about the field in sociological sense. It's really, it's rather that uh, it, it's not really, it's modus operandi is not really uh, in, uh, in stricto sensu a field because uh, the, the borders of the field are really blurred 
And you can only pretend that you work in the cultural field, but in reality, you are actually totally exposed to all the toxicality of that, uh, that any kind of social dimension uh, contains uh, in, in Ukraine. So in this sense, I mean here that, um, that Ukrainian cultural institutions don't have a, a kind of a buffer zone or a kind of a, a institutional skeleton for protection that would uh, prevent the field uh, from any kind of interventions from the outside, right? So unlike the cultural field in the West, uh, where you can basically like refer or research uh, different uh, political issues or, or societal issues, but at the same time, everybody understands that this is being done in culture, that it's simply art and that's it. So uh, you have some, some kind of uh, autonomy in this sense. In Ukraine, it's quite the opposite. It has its pros and cons, but basically that's uh, institutionality itself is basically the weakest point of the modus operandi of, of, uh, of, of, of contemporary culture in Ukraine. So in this sense, uh, uh, the state uh, hasn't been defining the way how Ukrainian culture looks like, right? It rather depended on, the, on different initiatives or, or collective subjectivities uh, uh, which uh, have been operating in the field. And it's another kind of a pretty characteristical feature that when we speak about Ukrainian culture uh, in terms of its institutionality, we rather speak about collectives, initiatives, platforms, projects, but not about institutions, which means that we are lacking even in the, on the level of uh, very superficial level of uh, vocabulary that we apply uh, in our analysis or overview, that it's uh, quite, uh, quite lacking uh, some sustainability for not even speaking about the long run, but even in the mid run, mm -hmm. right? But uh, so that's why the Maidan event as such was so uh, productive for uh, for Ukrainian culture, because it was a really a very fruitful uh, uh, playground for various interactions and actually different initiatives uh, were really simply booming on Maidan. And actually the way how Ukrainian culture looks like today is basically only thanks to Maidan and uh, that we had Maidan, including uh, the institution that I am running and the Kyiv Biennial Endeavor itself it wouldn't be just impossible and wouldn't make even any sense without the Maidan event. Because I mean, I, in general, I believe uh, this kind of a revolutionary experience or a square occupation experience uh, is basically the best uh, Biennale project one could imagine, right? It's, uh, it's totally uncomparable with whatever Venice or Kassel are presenting even at the, at the moment. So in this sense, um, I think it's also important to take into account that many initiatives and collectives that uh, were active uh, after Maidan were actually somehow trying to uh, create some such circumstances after the revolution itself, in which uh, uh, those uh, collective uh, endeavors and initiatives that emerged uh, on this square could have some proper continuation and implementation in a societal body of, uh, of the country, so to say. So basically in this sense, it, it, it's really powerful because uh, uh, Ukrainian contemporary culture is very much a revolutionary one, right? But at the same time, in terms of institutionalization, uh, not everything has been changed, right? Like we, we've got uh, after Maidan some new uh, funding institutions, which was really also unprecedented in throughout the Ukrainian history, like the Ukrainian Cultural Foundation, for instance, and, and some others. But at the same time, I think that uh, this, uh, this positioning, uh, especially uh, from the, the perspective of the current experience, this, uh, this positioning between the revolution and the war is really a defining one 
in order to understand how uh, how um, Ukrainian cultural field uh, operates, because uh, the revolutionary situation uh, was indeed very productive and uh, generative in terms of uh, producing new types of institutions and in general the way how art was has been made and uh, what kind of topicalities were tackled within the cultural field and so on. Whereas in, in, in the wartime, it's totally disruptive, especially to, to institutions, right? The war is not at the time for institution building. So, and, and uh, though, of course, I mean, the, the war, as Marta already mentioned, started eight, eight years ago, but at the same time, this uh, full-fledged war uh, put uh, actually all the even existing institutions in, in wreckages. So in this sense, uh, we, had, uh, we had to switch to other types of uh, activities in order to sustain ourselves under these unprecedented harsh uh, circumstances. So in this sense, I would name a, a few uh, sort of dimensions in which I think, I mean, some of them were already named uh, here many times uh, throughout the conference, uh, throughout the symposium. But, uh, but today, basically, most of the cultural institutions are busy uh, mostly with, first of all, with uh, this effort of uh, evacuating uh, collections and uh, artworks. It especially concerns uh, some peripheral cultural sites, uh, meaning that which are not in the main cities of, of Ukraine. Uh, evacu evacuation effort, right, is actually one of the main ones uh, that uh, the cultural institutions have to uh, have to embrace. Uh, then, of course, uh, it's uh, very much uh, these activities are very much connected to uh, and focused on documenting Russian war crimes in in Ukraine. We just hope that uh, all these types of documentation that uh, various artists and artistic institutions uh, are being uh, are making will will become a kind of a part of some court case against the the so-called Russian Federation. And thirdly, of course, many institutions have embarked on the uh, on the endeavor. Uh, of uh, creating various types of uh, emergency initiatives or support initiatives helping individual artists uh, with their with some basics but at the same time trying to help to create some uh, art re emergency residencies uh, for those who decided or had to stay uh, in the country so in this sense i mean that basically we are, we are facing a really unprecedented challenge because it, it has been always hard even without this full-fledged war. But now we don't have any other way out than go through the war in, in, with, with our endeavors. And uh, most, um, most importantly is that basically this challenge is how to build up new institutions which, which are required at the moment and will be required for for operational purposes uh, with regards to the cultural field in the years to come and which of course is a uh, is a much harder uh, effort to undertake uh, under the worker conditions but at the same time i think with regards to the cultural field it it, it follows more or less the same logic like, like what we discussed today with uh, regarding the uh, uh, the uh, the problematics of psychotherapy right or or for that matter also the the uh, mil military realm right because uh, i don't think that um, especially uh, taking into account that uh, that today uh, we, in, in cultural realm we have almost no budget from the side of the state Though we were not dependent on that, but at the same time, it also shows that uh, the future, that uh, what what it holds for us, is really um, super problematic for to continue what we already had. So in this sense, we, we it's even not about some type of reconstruction again that other participants were voicing also their doubts 
with regards to this concept, but at the same time, it's really about constructing something anew. And uh, for that matter, I think uh, with regards also to the title of this panel, that uh, I do believe that uh, in this sense, it could work only like with regards to psychotherapy or the military realm, right? That uh, our uh, co foreign counterparts, uh, apart from showing uh, solidarity and humanitarian efforts in their own countries respectively, uh, would be able to come here to work here and to stay here. And in this sense, I think this also requires um, rethinking and revisioning uh, of uh, the way how, uh, how contemporary culture, especially contemporary art operates internationally. It also, it's also about the way uh, the, the, the funding, it's not only about the funding possibilities, right? But in general, the metrics on which uh, contemporary art real is based, is mostly conducting projects, right? And mostly some short-term collaborations. But if we think seriously about sustainability of the field, it's of course about uh, uh, positioning and placing ourselves in exact circumstances in other country and work together on the challenges that this country faces. So I believe that without that, we would, uh, we would be in much more problematic uh, situation that we are now uh, in the moment with regards to the social catastrophe, the economic crisis, and not speaking about the uh, un unbelievable huge price that Ukrainians are paying every day in terms of uh, human lives. So that's also the way how we can address uh, so I, I hope that other uh, people on, on here on the panel would also somehow talk about that. How is it possible with regards to this mutualism or uh, establishing some international networking that it's not just sharing experiences or uh, making some collaborative projects together, but um, if we speak really seriously about this European integration, right? So let's put this, uh, this uh, challenge on a much higher level, whether uh, these uh, uh, EU networks or cultural networks or artistic uh, institutions that collaborate constantly in the West would be ready to embark on such an endeavor coming here, for instance, open up some their offices or spin-off events here, but staying here on the constant basis. I think uh, this is really very practical and pragmatic issue, but that would really help, uh, especially those initiatives and collectives in Ukraine, which are indeed autonomous and dependent only on the collaboration with their uh, counterparts abroad. I put comma here and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Pasin. Very enlightening comments. With that, um, I would really appreciate uh, taking the points put out by Vasil and invite Olya Zhuk. Uh, you are the deputy director of a major institution, uh, Mastetsky Arsenal, which has the appearance of being a state institution. But in fact, you know that it's not a state institution. But if you can speak a bit more about where, what is your predicament now? How do you resort more nimbly to operations while evacuating and sustaining some program? If you can speak to us about that, that would be very helpful. Yes. <clears throat> uh, thank you for this perfect introduction, Vasil. Uh, actually, I wanted to tell also that um, there is some misconception about institutions in Ukraine uh, because um, uh, international audiences, they tend to project institutional models which exist abroad to Ukrainian situation. And this is not always relevant. It's like Ukrainian institutions are striving to this international models, but it uh, is stuck in the old uh, post-Soviet uh, system 
of operating in culture, especially when it comes to state institutions. And on the one hand, uh, state institutions are uh, very limited in its operations by this old uh, type of procedures. But on the other hand, they do not have sufficient support from the state. And it appears that those inst state institutions which have commitment uh, to their audiences, uh, to their uh, mission, they, uh, they, they really cannot uh, manage it. Uh, so they don't have enough uh, support from the state. At the same time, there is this projection from uh, international donors, international audiences. They have this misconception that national institutions are supported uh, by the state. They are, but not uh, in a scope as it is abroad. And now when the war... Uh, <coughs> started, we are in a situation when uh, state institutions like Dovzhenko Center, like uh, Mostetsky Arsenal, they have uh, the same problems as independent institutions, but at the same time, they are not regarded uh, as um, independent ones, they are very limited their possibilities. Uh, they cannot apply to the same grants as NGOs, uh, and uh, they are really uh, struggling very hard to keep their institutions alive. Uh, so I think that um, there is this problem really of pro projection of some international models into Ukrainian situation. I'm speaking, of course, from my point of view, from uh, this uh, point of view of uh, a person who works in a state institution. But um, I think that uh, independent institu institutions also would share this point. And I think there is some, somehow this gap between understanding what's going on in Ukraine uh, and uh, it's rooted in some more ontological uh, thing. Uh, when I was listening today to previous discussions from panels on trauma, from panels uh, panel about uh, art practices where artists were talking, I thought that when we are speaking about institutions, we are all at the risk of getting too abstract, uh, but institutions, they also consist of people, of concrete uh, people. It's like when the war started, we all were split. We were a community, we were an institution, but when we were shocked by this Russian full-scale scale invasion, uh, we were uh, all uh, sitting either in shelters or in our apartments. Our teams were split. Some uh, of us uh, escaped abroad uh, with kids. And uh, for some time, we didn't exist as a, com as a community. And this was kind of a gap uh, with the start of war. But each of us, uh, uh, we understood that, that we represent an institution, that we have a mission, that we should do something. And when I was uh, myself um, uh, like in sleepless nights, sitting uh, in my hallway, uh, hiding from the bombs, uh, I wasn't desperate, I wasn't afraid, but I was thinking what, what, what I can do. I don't have connection to people. Uh, I, I uh, don't know what to do. And I messaged like everyone, and I thought that the priority is the people. Uh, first is uh, the survival of people, the artists of the teams, because it's the basis of the institutions. Uh, and uh, for this reason, uh, of course, all our previous projects, they were 
put aside for some time. But at that time, I thought what we can do to support people and the artists. And I messaged, for example, Vasil. I messaged uh, Olha Hunchar from Lviv Museum Crisis Center. I messaged our partner, NGO or Museum of Contemporary Art. And I asked, what are they doing just to be sure that we are on the same ground? And uh, it appeared that all of us share the same thing, that people, uh, individuals, our audiences are the basis for the institutions. That's the most important thing. And we understood that it's important to first to save the lives of these people. And then to think about programming, about projects, about various things. And uh, we all uh, were doing the same things at the same time. We were trying to fundraise, uh, to give some first aid uh, money to artists, to cultural workers, to museum workers, uh, to survive, to relocate. Uh, and uh, some of us united, for example, Mastesky Arsenal, we united with our efforts with uh, our partner and Joe Museum of Contemporary Art. We created emergency Ukrainian Emergency Art Fund. We uh, united all our fundraising activities and we started to give this small stipends, first aid, uh, to the artists, to, to independent cultural workers. And uh, this was not for art projects. We didn't judge on the basis of the merit of artist work or uh, any logic uh, of art market. It was uh, more to save the lives of people and to uh, maintain this field, like to uh, to, to save the lives of people, to ensure that in future the Ukrainian uh, institutional field will have uh, with whom to work, for whom to work. This is the most important thing. Uh, so, and uh, also when I was um, listening today to previous discussions, uh, I somehow recollected uh, the entry from the diary of the poet, Ukrainian poet from Donetsk, Ia Kiva, and uh, I revisited it, I took a note during our discussion. I think I would like to share because, because I think it's important uh, thought. Uh, she, wrote, she said that, uh, she wrote, to think about the war as impossibility of certain things, as of, as of incompatibility, discrepancy under this sky, this space, to think about the war as about the space. And I think if we consider this, how uh, Ukrainian institutions exist currently in this space affected by war, we would find more grounds for mutualism, actually, because we should consider that uh, basically we are not in the same equal positions. Mutualism is like a concept which is uh, a projection from biology field. It's uh, based on the idea that both sides get some benefits uh, from this interaction, from exchange. Uh, but I think that in current situation, which we are living, it's not, irrele it's not relevant. Uh, of course, uh, Western institutions, Western audiences, they can benefit from Ukrainian experience, but uh, it's not uh, the question to ask uh, what Ukrainian institutions can offer. Uh, that's my point. Thank you, Ola, for that poignant um, presentation. Arriving out of your point of mutualism, it's something we had discussed as well. 
in our previous conversations. And we had discussed about the commons and sort of my colleague, Professor Keller Easterling sort of corrected that and brought in the term mutualism. Keller, I'm wondering if you can discuss how it's possible to approach that, that not from the point of view that it is the solution, that it has its constraints. If you can speak to that a bit more. Well, thank you. I mean, it's a, a testament to, to the organizers, Marta and Michael and Sophia and others, that this is just one of many conversations that we've been, we've had. And, um, and I sort of, as a result of those many conversations, which has really been the event here is that we have been able to talk. Um, um, I agreed to sort of ask a few couple of, of questions. Um, and one of, one of them did have to do with mutualism and thinking about areas that are under siege in the world, historically or contemporary, you know, in indigenous areas surrounded by hostilities or black communities in the Jim Crow South surrounded by white supremacists or a Palestinian archipelago uh, surrounded by hostility, Ukraine under military bombardment and, and the ways in which those communities often develop some form of survival that Vasil and Ilya have described um, that relies on internal mutualism that they activate communi community economies in Palestine to some mode uh, or networks of care and maintenance and kinship that indigenous and abolitionist black feminist thinkers call for as a force that dominant forces can't really totally dissolve. Um, and those networks have emerged under duress in Ukraine and, and art, art, many other kinds of institutions, art institutions, um, maybe because they are born of an art of protest, um, have joined in, in helping to deliver everything from food and shelter to mental health care. Um, and people on this call have been part of that physical, spatial work. Um, and at the same time, that there's these intensified local situations, they are also accompanied by these networks of some kind of international exchange. I mean, uh, uh, it's not expecting something from Ukraine, uh, but but it's part of all of our care and kinship to be filling all the personal institutional Zoom waves around the world, especially in the last year. And you know, maybe that could be called a kind of mobility commons, a kind of commons that can't be shut down. Um, so Ukraine is one place, but also a diaspora situated, heavy, hard, but also diasporatic mutualism. Um, and and but in our conversation, still just sort of disappointed with that idea. Um, still, neither form of mutualism enough, and, and and might it even be a double-edged sword in terms of you know internal recovery from the war? Will those sturdy forms of community uh, remain, or will they just help to foster business as usual within persuasions about resilience? You know, that's been brought up a few times. And and in the international scene, uh, you know, there's the specter of Susan Sontag mentioned yesterday, but does, does that external network only provide a means to cope or it, it might it even allow a global network of art institutions to avoid their responsibilities or or launder their identities with, with programming? Um, you know, these are institutions moving within contemporary empire uh, I mean, I, I wanted to say this because I think, you know, there's no question that this form of empire has continuities with settler colonial, colonialism, but of course, you know, uh, it's worse than that. Uh, it's, it's that and more, it's also a pastiche of, of pre-modern empire, colonizing empires of the last 500 years, as well as treacherous and less traceable fibers of neoliberal empire since the G7 or the G8 overpowered the G77 in the late 20th century. 
and, and you know, developed fresh forms of slavery and oppression, re refreshed forms, I should say, uh, forms of slavery and oppression of beings and the planet. And, you know, without being attuned to those forces, you can be outwitted again when this apparatus arrives in Ukraine post-war with all of its defense leveraged extraction and mixed with things mentioned yesterday, you know, not innocuous standard making consensus and its mob of, of, of NGO yes men. Uh, so it, it's, it's one projection that um, in these fluid sovereignties uh, to think about a um, kind of discontinuous uh, planetary commons. Um, I mean, as was mentioned this morning that this is so generative that one might think of this discontinuous commons merged with mobility commons as a, as a possible model for a planetary commons with planetary responsibilities. But again, that rhetoric can always be outwitted by, by the political superbugs of this new pastiche of empire with, with their sort of shape-shifting powers. Um, anyway, there's more to say, but that's just for one little offering. Thank you, Keller. Uh, just still, I'm wondering if you can, or if you'd like to speak to this or Ola or Peter. Yeah, I, uh, I think that this idea of mutualism, it's uh, kind of academic slang, to be honest. Uh, well, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I had to Google it first, uh, I must confess. Uh, uh, but uh, what I think that maybe for our situation, uh, the idea of mutualism, which is driven by benefits, by the idea of exchange, is not too relevant exactly because... As I said, we are not initially in equal in the same situations. We cannot speak about exchange. Uh, and maybe for us it's more relevant the idea, Plato's idea of metaxis. Uh, this is the word which he used uh, to describe the condition of in-betweenness uh, of uh, transitional state. And uh, the, the uh, state of involvement of one world to the other. And when we speak about, mut about mutualism, uh, maybe we should speak not how we can exchange something, uh, how we can benefit from each other, but maybe we can try to think how we can participate in worlds of each other, how we can share, how we can um, uh, somehow explore each other. Uh, because even when, when it comes uh, to discussions, for example, we had, I think each of us representatives of cultural institutions had a lot of discussions at the beginning of war throughout these months with various uh, global international institutions who made Zoom calls and they asked uh, what we can do. Uh, and, and when we uh, tried to explain the situation in, in which we are, they were not eager to change their practices uh, to change the bureaucratic procedures, to go beyond uh, project thinking. Uh, uh, and uh, so for me, it looks like the Western institutional world is more eager like to, to invest into supporting Ukraine abroad, uh, or uh, some activities in which uh, the members of their states are involved. But it's not the real interaction. It's like uh, following the, all the same models which existed before. Uh, 
It's not about exploration. It's not about research. It's not considering any re realities of war. Uh, that's what I'm talking about, the necessity of this involvement of one world to the other, of exploration, of hearing each other, not just of having another Ukrainian at some international panel speaking because it's a trendy topic, you know. I, I wanted to, to bring that point to Vasil because we had spoken before and I think Keller mentioned the reciprocity, right? Like, is there something that by staying in place, and I know that that's a precarious condition within which to stay, and, but by staying in place and inviting that kind of collaboration in place, is it, is it, are we facing a situation where the international art community is kind of dealing with their own amb ambivalence in how to proceed? And is there something to be, to be drawn from this gap and from this time of which there is a collapse of things as we knew it or language as we knew it. And now, as you're saying, we need to think of new, new terms and new language, perhaps not, um, as you say, academic slang or something like that, but a new type of, just as we were speaking in the, in the issues of uh, psychotherapy. You know, when there's there's nothing to be said, and then there's just like some babble that comes out. And Basil, you had mentioned that that perhaps on that perhaps it, perhaps it is that moment, but it's too early to say. I don't know. Yeah, thanks so much. I would just uh, really pick up where Olya uh, uh, left. Uh, uh, this point because it's actually um, it's actually the question what is really mutual in this mutualism right in the process of uh, be it mobility commons or uh, the process of the so-called commoning uh, what in general what what in fact we are are we uh, experiencing as uh, the common, right? What, what do we have in common in this common in? So in this sense, uh, you know, as an institution like, uh, which was established uh, already 14 years ago, we have been, uh, we have been working uh, a lot with, um, with our institutional counterparts in, in, in the EU and elsewhere, uh, who, uh, who actually have been always claiming their radical uh, political engagement and uh, social involvement. And, uh, and uh, as we already, I mean, a bit discussed, but I think that it's really important to uh, somehow to address this openly that, uh, that in general, I would say, at least in, in my institutional experience that uh, I have had uh, throughout the last half a year, I would say that most of the uh, Western cultural institutions have failed politically in, uh, in, uh, like in their re response to the war emergency. So, of course, I mean, we have to acknowledge absolutely here that uh, basically without this uh, solidarity support, financial support, and uh, humanitarian involvement, uh, the Ukrainian cultural field wouldn't survive. That's more than obvious, right? It's again like the same as with the with the um, uh, weaponry, right? That that is requ required for the country at war. So without these instruments, without these uh, supportive structures, we wouldn't be uh, in the form that we are now, right? Uh, at least. But at the same time, I think. Uh, if we speak really politically, uh, what we actually observed uh, that most uh, or pretty many uh, cultural institutions in the West have decided just to resort themselves only to humanitarian cause, right? Only like uh, keep their institutional boundaries in place and they were too afraid to trespass them as in my view, unfo very unfortunately, 
because uh, they didn't use uh, their social capital, their uh, cultural privileges, and their political connectivity for the Ukrainian cause. They were not ready to, to go outside their usual uh, borders in culture, to go out there into politics in order to influence the decision-making processes with regards to the developments here in Ukraine. I mean, making as much pressure as possible on their, for instance, respective governments to create constant discomfort for their audiences, for their publics, that it's not just to uh, enough to host refugees, though it's again, it's super valuable. But again, I'm speaking from an institutional perspective with the political involvement, right? So if we take this into account, it actually didn't work out because uh, they were not ready to embark on this, uh, on this endeavor in order to, to make uh, constant pressure. Because it's basically, again, like it has to be inscribed in the in the wider framework of uh, of the of the recent developments, right? Because it's more than obvious that without the pressure from the civil society or from from in general from the political society, right? In in most of the countries in the West, uh, even this level of sanctions or this level of uh, military support wouldn't be possible. So it's only thanks to the pressure of the general public in the West, the, the pressure on their respective governments, that these governments were, were really kind of uh, put in the corner and had no other way, than, way out than to do as much possible in their view uh, to, to support Ukraine. So I think th this politicality, this political instrument which I think is central to the idea of commoning or mutualism. Uh, with, even if we, if we take aside any kind of ideological involvement, but really pure politicality in culture, is it possible or not? So it's uh, exactly like what Ola was describing that it was much easier to, uh, to go on with usual uh, institutional practices in the art field, right? opening up exhibitions or inviting Ukraine artists or speakers at different events. So th this is super important. Of course, it contributes to the cost, right? But at the same time, apart from Ukraine, but, but in general even, I mean, I am not very much in favor of imitating any kind of normalcy under the current circumstances. So I, I know that there are institutions uh, and perhaps for some institutions, it's a proper way uh, to, to tackle the, the current situation, right? Like um, opening up exhibitions. I don't think that opening up new exhibitions, even in the Western Europe, is the most urgent thing with regards to the cultural field, actually. So it's also about the mutualism and communism. And, and communism. Uh, yeah, it, it's a Freudian sleep, of course. But I think it's a Freudian sleep on the, on the side of the authors of this uh, term, Hart and Negri in particular. But uh, I think it's also uh, the, the situation that how do we use our uh, political capabilities and uh, social imagination in order for a, a certain cultural institution being in the West to become a political subject? Do they have a political subjectivity or not, right? Because without this politicality involved, I don't think that any kind of proper mutualism is possible and uh, would be effective just because uh, there are no other instruments. Because if you don't leave your comfort zone, if you don't leave your white cube space mm -hmm. and make politics outside, then uh, how can you pretend, uh, how can you, uh, how can you pretend to make uh, politics inside? So right? for example, so this, this sense, is where this <laughs> kind of real politic moment when it came, when it, uh, when in the West, uh, when it approached the cultural field in the West, it appeared that the, the, in institutional terms, the cultural field was not ready to tackle this. On this subject, I, I mean, we, for example, I just have to add that 
the Venice Biennial opened and it will close with only a closed Russian pavilion funded by a Ukrainian sugar beet baron in the early part of the 20th century guarded. It was guarded. And so therefore the biennial went on and um, there was some tacit additional or important, but yet tacit uh, additional programming. This, this brings me to the subject. And of course the one that I would uh, uh, like my colleague Peter to speak about on this. Okay, so we have war. Are art and war, are the, is this a contradiction? Is this something should, that we should even be discussing? Peter, if you can. Um, I'm not sure that's quite my topic, but um, <laughs> I'd like I to say short I, don't believe, I don't believe there is such a thing in existence as an international art community. <laughs> there are various international art institutions which in various different ways stage, stage particular uh, presentations and different forms of political subjectivity, but I don't think they're a community and I don't think they have any political agency. Uh, and I think as Basil has pointed out, that's been demonstrated really clearly. Um, I wanted to say something slightly different, um, which is to do with the ideological political content and cultural function of our institutions that might come into existence in Ukraine in the, in the post-war. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm quite attracted to, to Vassal's sort of covert thesis that, and I think it's your covert thesis, you didn't quite state it explicitly, that the, uh, the institutional weakness of the cultural field in Ukraine might be a condition for a new kind of politically institutional strength later on, right? In other words, not being burdened with the heritage of a certain established uh, set of institutions which you would feel obliged to reconstruct or after the war, it leaves the cultural field much more open. Uh, and therefore, in a sense, the cultural field becomes a site with many more political possibilities, precisely because of its, uh, its previous institutional weakness. Um, I'm, I'm attracted to that, to that idea, but I'm, what, I, what I wanted to just very briefly talk about and ask you about, um, Concerns, concerns the contradict the necessarily contradictory structure of this ideological space uh, of cultural institutions, and in particular the problem of of nationalism um, or the national the national stroke nationalism, which are I think in some way uh, inextricable. You can't really separate those those terms. And at, at the beginning. Um, Yesterday, Mikhail, in his introduction, spoke about the kind of the contradictory character of the situation. Uh, I wanted to, to propose that we, we take the contradictory character of this situation sort of methodologically serious, seriously as a kind of structural condition. Um, and to suggest that the main contradiction that is likely to, if you like, characterize this field as it comes out of a war is the contradiction between national formations and ideological structures on the one hand and international, transnational, or possibly more interestingly, simply non-national um, ideological uh, and political political formations, because I think in a way, you know, the, the question for me is how, how, how does a society in war, okay, how does it in the, in the immediate aftermath of war, how does it mitigate the effect of the Manichaean logic of war on the cultural field? 
I mean, that, that for me is the problem. In other words, how do you avoid the continuation of the necessarily nationalistic cultural logic of war, which is simply produced by war into the post-war in a way that becomes reactionary, right? That seems to me to be the, the general question, which is to sort of has its incredibly sharp positing in the Ukrainian situation. I mean, you know, I mean, the UK at the moment, you know, the UK in its imagination is still in fact fighting the Second World War. Uh, you know, we've been going 77 years since the end of the war, um, which they restarted in a certain sense in their imagination with Brexit. And they seem determined to fight it to the point at which they can decisively eventually lose it, which they may well be doing now. Um, so, you know, coming from the UK, one has the strength of the, this incredible sense of the amazing cultural conservatism that can be carried from a war, from a success in war, not a defeat, from a success in war into the post-war uh, and, and kind of obliterate uh, and accommodate and appropriate uh, all kind of progressive cultural formations. Um, so that, that, that for me is in a way, is in a way the question and my, the methodological point I wanna make about such a structural contradiction is that you don't get out of a structural contradiction like that by either attempting to reconcile it in some way because it's structural or by attempting to choose one side or the other. But really by, by thinking about what you know, institutional forms mediate and negotiate these contradictions in ways which will transform them. Uh, and if you like, transform the content of the nationalism. Because I wonder if, I mean, I, I appreciate it. I really like Basil's idea that there's a sense in which Ukrainian cultural nationalism could be imagined to begin in 2014, right? But, but in a sense, what begins in 2014 is the backward look, right? The strength of the present is in some way overwhelmed by the weight of the backward look that its standpoint creates. Um, and obviously the reconstruction, the architectural and art conservation dimension of reconstruction will primarily be along that line, right? Uh, will be along the line uh, of artifacts. It will be within the terms of the concept of heritage. Uh, I thought it was interesting yesterday in the discussion of heritage that while some people were trying to complicate the concept of heritage, other people really wanted to, to embrace it. Um, and I suppose from a general theoretical point of view, I think you know, the, the possibilities for progressively experimental new political cultures, um, new political artistic cultures will always be overwhelmed if they're anywhere near the concept of heritage. Um, I don't know. Anyway, that's maybe that's enough for what I've said. Maybe you'd be interested to know what um, Olya and Basil have to say. Um, well, uh, uh, I have uh, some thoughts on it. I think that uh, this type of uh, idea that this war is related to nation nationalism would arise only in uh, this uh, mindset uh, of a country, this uh, colonialist past, uh, in, in fact, because uh, I don't understand, despising the very idea of the nation, of the national identity, uh, it, for me, it's like a luxury of uh, someone who is 
in a country, in a world who, who, uh, who has long history of peace, who doesn't have this threat, like a neighbor who is all the time threatening your existence. You know, it's not about nationalism. It's about uh, identity, about survival, in fact. Uh, uh, yeah, and I think that's what I meant. The war, the logic of war, produces that you can't escape it. I think it's it's inevitable. It's part of antagonism. Yes, but also you know to offer to someone who is processing this post-colonialist trauma uh, to to people who are trying to reaffirm their identity to skip it and uh, just to jump into some uh, global world order. It's like denying, uh, depreciating like their uh, trauma. Yeah, it's not that, right. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting there's a structural contradiction between a necessary nationalism and a necessary anti-nationalism. That that's a structural contradiction that you can't in some sense of void and that you think have to think about how to mediate. Yes, but, uh, but Peter, I, don't believe Peter, in I have a question for you. Do yeah. you understand that uh, this point of view, it in some way coincides with Russian uh, imperial propaganda? No, I, I, I think that this is a product of the logic of war, okay, since the 18th, uh, 17th century in Europe, right? It's a, it's a product of the deep institutional structures and it's produced in this instance by Russian aggression, right? I mean, okay, I mean, other, it, you know, it, it, it's an effect, it's an effect of, you know, of Russian aggression as well as a reaction to it, yeah? Yes, but at the That's same the time, uh, this discourse, it, it's really like repeats what Russian propaganda says. And it looks like one is, uh, looks like the discourse present uh, in countries like which have this colonialist past coincide with imperial discourse of the country, which is uh, uh, really killing, making genocide in my country. Yeah. It's a point about war in Europe since the 17th century. That it's a general. It, it's it's the general structure. Vasil, will you? Uh, because I I want to also include some questions from the audience. Vasil, would you like to comment on this? Because it's it's a it's a you know this is this is important right. point to to break yeah, down. Absolutely. And I want to absolutely. have your thought as well, so that. Yeah, I think that, well, in general, I think what Ole is uh, actually referring to is, uh, so, yeah, I totally, I'm, I mean, I, I totally get the Peter's point, right? But at the same time, I think that it's also very important that uh, apart from that, it's um, kind of um, uh, pretty often that we encounter that, uh, like, uh, like when, when speaking to, to our Western colleagues uh, and so on, that like uh, people uh, pretty often cannot qu quite get right w what it really means that uh, someone is saying that you are deprived of the right to exist, right? I mean, I understand that the, this is a, like a pretty typical war experience or one of the outcomes or embedded in the war itself, right? Uh, since the 17th century or, or even perhaps earlier. Uh, but uh, I also think that we have to take into account that it's really like this kind of logic that uh, I, I don't want to exaggerate, but really reminds a bit the, the, the experience of Jews some 80 years ago, or also perhaps some, at least partly, some experiences of the uh, LGBTQ community in authoritarian uh, states, right? That like this kind of uh, chain reaction logic that you you don't exist, but since you do exist, you don't have to exist, so you have to be eliminated. You know, it, it's, uh, it goes even beyond, I think, uh, a nationalist uh, framework as such. But at the same time, I, I totally understand that uh, unavoidably as one of the effects that war produces 
inevitably, unfortunately, is this uh, some rise of uh, nationalistic discourse or some self affection, nationalistic self affection in a way. So um, it's very hard to be addressed, uh, to, to address this uh, at the moment, right? But I think that your point about like that you reiterated with regards to the institutional weakness of the field in Ukraine is indeed something to be considered in this sense. Because I think, what, uh, for, uh, first of all, it's also very important as, uh, institutionally in the cultural field to keep in mind that um, the, the, uh, with regards to many museums and cultural sites, uh, any kind of reconstruction is just impossible. It's again, building totally something new, right? But this also structurally somehow underpins other uh, challenges that we have. Because I mean, what is contemporary art in this sense today, right? Does it, uh, does it include uh, Maria Primachenko or not, right? Does it include some uh, traditional embroidery of Ukrainian origin, for instance? Why not, right? Especially, so especially when we are lacking the exact institutions that sort of take care of the <laughs> contemporary art or whatever you call it, right? I mean, but at the same time, uh, there is a kind of a new, so to say, potentiality in order to embrace those realms and spheres that were on the margins of the so-called contemporary cultural production on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, politically and ideologically, I think this is also would be really very helpful to, to constantly sort of stick to this because whatever the ideology uh, is shared among uh, these Ukrainians or other Ukrainians structurally and internationally Ukrainian position today is uh, anti-fascist per se, right? As such, so even even for those who who were or used to be or who are on the right or even far right side of the political spectrum, the structure defines their role in the current warfare in a different way. To compare it to what they think of themselves, even right, it's it, it applies the same uh, in the same way to the uh, to the Kremlin uh, uh, war discourse, right? They can design their occupational efforts in whatever uh, Soviet terms, right? But it any it but unavoidably in its essence, in its nature, it's a fascist uh, imperialist logic. So in this sense, I think that. Uh, Ukraine has really, under the current circumstances, has this potential of transnationality or internationality to be really widespread, that Ukrainian agenda is not only about Ukraine, but is really about internationalism as such, whether in, in general, any kind of internationalism would be possible in, on the European continent, accompanied with all the, the colonial efforts and anti-imperial efforts, right? But at the same time, I think that on the one hand, we have this kind of institutional void in culture, which is also full of potentiality to be filled in properly. Again, it depends on mutualism in, in the real politics sense, in my view, right? But at the same time, ideologically, I think we can work with this context, being locals or the outsiders in a really new progressive way. And it's actually also, with regards to this nationalism, which is embedded in a way in the war, but at the same time nationalism after the war, but also about anti-fascism, I think it's also a broader question to be posed not only to Ukrainians, but to other countries in Europe, in which, because of so-called Ostpolitik or whatever, anti-fascism became totally like a stupid subcultural fashion without real political meaning, it's also an international problem. It's not only a Ukrainian one, right? So I think these issues have really to be ad addressed internationally in order to not just to win this war, but, but to have some really progressives uh, in, the, in the aftermath of, uh, of it, I would say. Okay, I, I have to, because we're, these are, we're at a very strong moment and I don't want to just close it down, um, but I also, I see that Keller would like to comment or it seems like you want to comment. On this, <laughs> I'm seeing something there. 
I, I just wanted to, I mean, just remembering our many conversations, what I wanted to echo was the, the conclusions that we seem to come to at the end of every conversation, which was that the art world is a simply has not developed a capacity to be a political actor and that the international art world, that it has much to learn from Ukraine uh, that that the the works of art and and I'm and you know even the in internal mutualism and I'm not, we weren't talking about some kind of transactional international mutualism that's that's a misunderstanding uh, but the internal mutualism the the act of Maidan the 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 art as protest that that is what the rest of the world has to learn. Um, as some way of of countering, um, you know, the stupidity of of the art world already riding along the tilted playing fields of global capital uh, that are part of this kind of pastiche of empire. I was trying to say was much worse than many of the uh, kind of um, uh, settler colonial uh, patterns that we fear. Um, and and the art world is is riding those waves uh, and and more than you know more than many other institutions. So I thought some of the best things we came with were came from our discussions were a critique of that art world with its silly nation state art fairs and and so on uh, and, and an art world that you know could could learn from from Ukraine. I think that uh, you, uh, Keller, um, we're approaching, I think, so, and we have questions and comments, which I think would re be respectful of the uh, attendees of our uh, uh, event. Um, also, I, I just want to say, I would like to differentiate nationalisms from the type of informational communications agenda that war elicits, which is about identifying and concretizing the identity of a nation. It's by, it's, it's in a country in defense. And so therefore it's not something that came, they came into it. It's something that becomes a type of informational. And the discussions of cultural heritage, the, what, the one thing I do think is interesting is the fact that the openness of Ukrainian identity that existed from 1990 to 2000, right? Very much a transitional point had to do with evolving economic and political systems. You had a clash between what had been a Soviet Ukraine and a Soviet controlled economy to a sudden influx of capitalism and a capitalist market economy, which then confused identi identity formation, right? I mean, I, let's take the Crimean Tartar, autonomous region of Crimean Tartars. The president of that region said, we will not claim autonomy until we understand our cultural identity because they had been so dispersed. Now that's a different situation from Ukraine. But the fact is, it is interesting that as of 2014, there is this dawn, right? There is this time to rethink what an institution is. And so what I think that war allows, the success of war, what success of war may allow for, is for a new kind of institution and a new more open and mobile institution that doesn't inherit from nationalism, but inher inherits a generative national identity. Now, I, I just want to go to um, the, the, the comments and I'm, I'm asking the participants to stay with us for some more minutes because it would be respectful. Um, there is one uh, comment here from Maxim Kodak, which says, uh, post-Soviet system, in my feeling, created some subversive system of institutional power, meaning that to have power is to avoid the existing set of rules, not create a set of rules which others can follow. Self-organized institutions ontologically exist as opposition to over-bureaucratized Western institutions. 
but what and how self-organized institutions in Ukraine can oppose the authority. Because if we look at them together, they try to do the same thing, to avoid rules, not create them. Hope my question and thesis will be clear to you. Thanks. I, I think that we respectfully, yes, please, Ola. Um, I think that there is, uh, after <clears throat> revolution of 2014, there is no really such opposition between the state uh, like institutions and uh, independent institutions. Uh, one of the effects uh, of this revolution was that people who worked in independent sector, they came deliberately to the state sector to change the state institutions. And what we see, like uh, institutions like Dovzhenko Center, like Mostetsky Arsenal, it's a new type of state institutions. They have their difficulties, they are reforming, but in fact, it's like quite a new generation of managers, of uh, uh, people who build strategies of these institutions. They cooperate with independent institutions. What we see now, for, for example, we cooperate with, uh, Mostetsky Arsenal cooperates with NGO, like in our, one of our main activities. Dovzhenko Center is like a landmark institution in film field, film museum, film archive which is struggling uh, at the same time with uh, the state uh, uh, the state pressure like they they want uh, currently to consult this institution and they have immense support uh, both from their partner institutions in the state field and uh, in independent field. So I think this distinction between uh, like independent and state institutions, it's lost a bit its relevance. Uh, this question could come before 2014. Now it's not really uh, such an issue. Thank you, Ola. I'd like to also uh, read something from one of our um, participants, from uh, Beatrice uh, Hoffman, who writes, nationalist is a construct that pretends the existence of a monolithic discourse, which seems bellied by the multiplicity of Ukrainian voices in this conference alone. That's a good point. Thank you, Beatrice. Um, and let me see, there is also yet uh, one more, I don't know, Mikhail, how are we on time? I... We have one minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, I let's, make it, let's make it five. Okay, but with that minute, uh, okay, should we just continue with the questions? Yeah, I think it makes sense to, to do justice to the comments that people have left in the Okay, in there the is... There is another comment by Oliver Oss. Is anyone familiar with the concept of left-wing nationalism or would you consider that an impossibility? Or after Mr. Osborne, is the post-war possible only if we let go of the World War II legacies, perhaps? Question mark. Does anyone want to pick that up? Laura, are you coming on? Is that a question? Is that a comment? Oh, no, no, sorry. <laughs> All right, with this, I would like to ask um, our last comments from all our panelists. Um, there's been a lot said. And do you have any closing remarks? Keller? Well, I just, I, I suppose I would um, just repeat um, that um, so many of our conversations, you know, pointed out the this, the impotence of a of a international art community to 
operate politically. Um, that even, I mean, even sometimes the, you know, filling of the Zoom waves and so on is a way to launder its identity uh, with programming and with, um, yeah, while, while, I mean, one of the things we said even in our conversations was that, you know, the real estate industry was more instrumental in, um, uh, in 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 being able to target and be part of sanctions than than the art world. What does that say about um, uh, the position of the art world as having any political capacity? Um, Thank you, Keller. Peter, closing closing remarks. Not really. I mean, just to say that my. I mean, I said in the reply to one of the questions in the. Uh, in the chat, um, I'm making a general conceptual point. I'm not making any claims about the content of Ukrainian national cultural discourse. I'm just talking about a structural cultural logic, which I believe obtains. Okay, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. And Olya? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, uh, I just wanted to add, maybe I was a bit too expressive, <laughs> but my point was that really institutions currently in Ukraine, they need, they are supporting like individuals, artists, cultural workers, but they themselves need support. And when it comes to mutualism, like uh, interactions with international field, uh, what we would really appreciate uh, it's not uh, the, uh, some level of conversation about mutual benefits, but uh, about sharing the understanding of mutual threat, which we are experiencing right now, that it's not only our war, you know? Uh, and you would like some involvement uh, on the level of uh, understanding, participating, in, uh, exploring what we are experiencing and trying to build some interactions on this basis, not on the basis of project planning of all bureaucratic procedures, which for years exist in big institutions. That, uh, that was my only point uh, of my criticism. It was a very good point. I think, I think you have. I think that everybody is is in, ag in agreement with you, Olya, yeah. and trying to express something quite similar. Thank you. Not a transactional mutualism is not what we're talking <laughs> about. Okay. Vasil, are you still? Yeah, here? maybe, uh, maybe I'm a bit right, ignorant. Right, you know, I'm not a professor <laughs> at Yale University. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, I am. I am. I would just add uh, that basically uh, it, it was the, the question about the difference between the state institution and some uh, non-state ones. I think uh, it's also a kind of a pretty common uh, misconception that being a state institution in Ukraine doesn't presuppose that you are a part of the state apparatus. <laughs> pretty often quite the opposite, unfortunately, also in terms of financing and support. But actually, I think like be it uh, the main thing for me in this regard, uh, also here on the ground, is basically that be it a state institution or some kind of an NGO or a grassroots initiative, right? I think the biggest problem that we face is that we have a few institutions here and there in Ukraine, but all them all together, they don't make up, don't make up the field as such. They uh, they are not. Uh, they are not a system, right? It's not a coherent field. So what I'm thinking or dreaming about in this sense is to, to fill in this lacuna, these uh, voids that we have in the field in order to make it really operational as a field, as a, a, as a cultural field, right, as such. And this depends only on us. So we can also think of some possible support uh, from the side of this Ukrainian state in the future, but I wouldn't rely on that, right? This is rather on exactly real political mutualism and, and uh, international collective uh, effort to make this happen. Thank you. 
I want to thank you all for participating. I've really respected our many conversations that we've had over the last two months. I know that we will remain um, a collective of sorts and grow that. Uh, I also want to convey how respectful I am of the work that you are doing, Ola, and your colleagues, and also Vasil in face of this incredibly challenging situation uh, where there are no monetary returns for the work you're doing. And it is the illustration of pure commitment to um, continue to seek alternatives and options. And I'm very grateful for the work you do. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And can we kind of make you, Sophia and I were talking in the in the break, uh, and we, I think it's important to recognize too that the, the, the speed with which the ground is shifting in Ukraine and I'm sure especially our, our Ukrainian colleagues are thinking about this. And when we had our decolonizing symposium back in March, Russia had just bombed Babinyar and Lviv for the first time. Whereas today, as we speak, Ukrainian armed forces have retaken Izium, which is an extraordinary thing and shifted the front by 70 yeah. kilometers. So that's uh, something that I suppose we have to pay a homage, homage to those to those soldiers who, who won that victory and um, yeah, um, cele cele celebrate them, and uh, it's a hopeful. It's a hopeful day. So, mm. thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. It's another loaded, important day. Mm. Thank you. Thanks thank so much. You. Bye bye. Ciao. Ciao.